My name's Ray, and this happened to me back in 1996. I was a trucker then, fresh, a rookie making runs up and down the East Coast. Some guys loved it, the solitude of the highway, all that jazz. But me? I craved some real human contact, a good conversation at a truck stop diner even. Maybe that's why that night turned out the way it did. I was hauling a load down through Georgia, running late on my delivery schedule. It was one of those nights, humid as hell, the kind where the air sits heavy on your skin even with the windows down. My AC was busted, of course. Lucky me. The radio was nothing but static, and even my trucker mixtape couldn't cut through the monotony. I was getting antsy, ready to call it a night, when I saw a neon sign flickering up ahead. Rosie's Place, it said, with an arrow pointing down a dirt road. Seemed like as good a place as any to get a cold drink and stretch my legs. I signaled and turned off the highway, following the narrow road for a couple of miles. The diner was a faded old thing tucked back into the woods, a few cars and another truck parked out front. I pulled in beside them, the gravel crunching under my tires. Stepping out of the cab, I felt a prickle of something wrong. It wasn't the place itself. Sure, it was a little run down, but what roadside joint isn't. No, it was something more unsettling, the kind of vibe you pick up in your gut, like sniffing spoiled milk. There wasn't another soul in sight, and an unnatural quiet hung over the place. I should have listened to my instinct, turned around, and gotten back on the road. But that coffee was calling my name. I walked up to the diner and peered inside. Dimly lit, it looked empty, save for a thin man behind the counter. He wore faded denim overalls and had greasy hair combed over a bald spot. An old country tune crackled from an unseen radio. I pushed open the door, a little bell jangling above my head. The man didn't look up, just kept wiping the counter with a dirty rag. I walked up, cleared my throat. He finally lifted his head, giving me a slack-jawed stare. His eyes were flat and dull, like a dead fish's. Coffee, I said louder than intended. The man mumbled something I couldn't make out and shuffled off into the back. I took a seat on one of the sticky vinyl stools and tried to make myself comfortable. The silence was unnerving. I pulled out a crumpled magazine from my backpack and pretended to read, all the while keeping an eye on the back room. When the man finally reappeared, he had a thick mug of steaming coffee. He set it down in front of me with a thunk that rattled the dishes. Anything to eat? I asked, trying for a friendly tone. He didn't answer. Just stood there staring, unblinking. Something wasn't right with this guy, but I didn't want to be rude. I took a sip of the coffee, grimacing. It tasted burnt and old. I pushed the mug away. Time to go. I pulled out some cash and slapped it on the counter. The man still hadn't moved. I cleared my throat again. Hey, I gotta hit the road. Finally, he blinked, slow and deliberate. He took the money and shuffled towards the old-fashioned register, his movements stiff and robotic. As he turned his back to me, I noticed a dark stain on the back of his overalls like spilled motor oil. Or maybe. My chest tightened. I edged toward the door, trying to move casually. As I reached for the handle, I heard a scrape behind me, like a chair pushed back. I whirled around. The man stood by the register, watching me. A thin line of drool ran down his chin. Then he took a step forward, and another, and I caught a whiff of something foul, a rotten smell of decay. There was no one behind the counter anymore, just a slick of dark fluid pooled on the dirty tiles. 
That's when I bolted, slamming open the door and sprinting across the parking lot. Behind me, I heard a guttural groan rising into a ragged shriek. I didn't look back. I threw myself into the truck, fumbling for my keys, my fingers slick with sweat. The engine roared to life, and I stomped on the gas, tearing out of that cursed parking lot. In the rearview mirror, I saw the figure emerge from the diner, silhouetted against the glowing neon sign. It stood there unnaturally still, then tilted its head, as if sniffing the air. For a long, terrible moment, I swear those dead eyes locked with mine across the distance. Then it began to lurch forward, moving with a strange, jerky gait, gaining speed in a way that wasn't humanly possible. My breath came in ragged gasps as I barreled back onto the highway, tires screeching. I glanced at the gas gauge. Barely a quarter tank left. Damn it. The closest town was miles away, and I wasn't sure I could make it without being overtaken by whatever that thing back there was. Ahead, the road curved around a bend, disappearing into the dense pines. Instinctively, I cut the headlights, then slowed the truck, easing off the shoulder into the pitch blackness. My heart hammered against my ribs as I watched the rearview mirror. Any second now, I expected to see that loping shape come hurtling through the darkness, those empty eyes fixed on me. Silence, except for the dull roar of my own blood in my ears. One minute ticked by. Then another. I started to think maybe I'd lost it. The thing from the diner wasn't out there. It was the stress, the long hours. Maybe I dozed off and had a nightmare. A flash of movement made me jolt. There, in the dim starlight, a figure emerged from the trees. Even at this distance, its stiff, uneven stride was unmistakable. It crossed the road, and then it was gone swallowed by the undergrowth on the other side. My blood ran cold. It was getting closer. I hit the gas, the truck lurching forward. I needed to put some distance between us, by some time to figure out what the hell to do. My mind raced. Called the cops? They'd laugh me out of the station. But who would believe a story like this? Up ahead, a flicker of light pierced the darkness. A house? A farmhouse? I swerved the truck onto a rutted dirt track, the branches of the trees whipping against the sides. The light grew brighter, revealing a ramshackle old house. A sliver of hope flickered in me. There might be people inside, a phone, help. I slammed the truck to a halt and leaped out, running towards the house. I pounded on the peeling wooden door. Hello? Hey, anyone home? I need help. Nothing but the chirp of crickets in the oppressive night air. I tried the door handle, and it swung open. The house was dark inside, smelling of dust and something more, organic. Fumbling for my phone, I flicked on the flashlight function. The weak beam cut through the gloom revealing a hallway with threadbare carpets. I hesitated. Fear battled desperation. I had to try something. Hello? I tried again, my voice trembling. It was answered by a groan, low and guttural, from somewhere deeper in the house. My stomach churned. That sound, I knew that sound from the diner. I turned to run, but it was too late. A figure stepped out of the shadows, the harsh light of my phone illuminating its hideous face. It was the man from the diner, or what was left of him. Skin hung in loose folds from his corpse-like face, his eyes were milky and vacant, and it was getting closer. I stumbled backward, my foot snagging on the rug. I fell with a thud, my phone clattering across the floor. The figure lunged. I screamed and kicked out, connecting with its shin. It stumbled, letting out a ragged cry. 
something black and slick splattered my shoes. The foul, rotting stench filled the air. I scrambled to my feet and ran blindly, crashing through furniture, knocking over a lamp. Behind me came the relentless sound of dragging footsteps. I burst through a door at the end of the hallway and into what looked like a kitchen. My eyes fell on a butcher block, a heavy cleaver resting on its surface. The thing lurched into the room. With a desperate surge of adrenaline, I grabbed the cleaver and whirled around to face it, my grip so tight the handle bit into my palm. It came at me, reaching out with clawed hands, a low, rasping growl emanating from its decayed throat. I swung the cleaver wildly, catching it across the shoulder. It held, stumbling back. I took another swing, this time connecting with something softer. Black fluid spurted, hitting the wall with a wet splat. The thing staggered, and I saw my opening. I sprinted past it, out the door, and back into the choking embrace of the night. I didn't stop running until I reached the tree line. Then I kept running, crashing through the undergrowth, branches tearing at my clothes, the desperate, shuffling pursuit close at my heels. Finally, my lungs burned and my legs felt like lead. I collapsed behind a thick tree, gasping for breath. The rustling sound stopped. Had I lost it? I waited, my chest heaving, straining to hear any sound over my own panicked breathing. A twig snapped. I whirled around. It emerged from the darkness, moving slowly now, its limbs hanging at unnatural angles. In the moonlight I saw that a large chunk of its shoulder was missing, black blood still oozing from the wound. Yet it kept coming. It couldn't end like this. With a roar of desperate frustration, I charged, swinging the cleaver one last time. The blade sank deep into its chest, and the creature let out a final, gurgling shriek. It shuddered, then collapsed to the forest floor. I stood there, panting, as the first rays of dawn began to pierce the gloom. The birds began their morning chorus, oblivious to the night of horror I'd barely survived. I didn't wait around. Somehow, I made it back to my truck and hit the road. I never stopped until I crossed the state line. I reported the diner, and the house, to the authorities, but they found nothing out of the ordinary, no bodies, no evidence of foul play. I went back a few months later, drawn by morbid curiosity. Rosie's place was boarded up, the neon sign dark and crumbling. It looked abandoned, like it had been for years. My name is Ben, and this happened to me in the spring of 2012. I've been driving truck routes for longer than I care to remember. Sometimes, it's the only thing that keeps my head on straight, the rhythm of the engine and the miles whizzing past. See, my wife, well, ex-wife now, she left a few years back. Took our little girl with her. That's a wound that still aches even with the calluses you build up in this profession. This particular trip, I was taking a load of construction supplies down to Texas, a long, straight shot through Oklahoma. It was one of those hot, humid nights where even the air inside the rig feels thick. I was tired, missing my daughter something fierce. The usual AM radio sermons weren't helping. It was just past midnight when I saw the light shimmering up ahead, kind of like a mirage in the desert. As I got closer, the light resolved into the neon script of a roadside sign. Millie's Diner Home Cooking 24 Hours Honestly, any food that wasn't from a gas station microwave sounded like heaven. I signaled a turn and pulled off the highway. The place had a rundown, faded charm to it. Some of the neon letters were dead, leaving the sign a little wonky. 
A few other trucks were parked in the lot, and I figured that was a good enough recommendation. Stepping out of the truck I noticed another thing. The place was quiet. Like too quiet. No hum of a generator, no laughter from inside, just a stillness that set my teeth on edge. Ignoring my gut, I pushed open the heavy diner door. A little bell jingled tiredly. The inside was dim, smelling faintly of grease and something else, musty, a little sour. Booths lined one wall, a long counter on the other. The whole place was deserted. Hello? My voice echoed in the silence. I called out again. No answer. Just an overturned glass on one of the tables, a dark stain on the worn countertop. Maybe the cook had stepped out back. My stomach grumbled, winning over my increasing unease. I took a seat at the counter, the sticky vinyl clinging to my skin. Anyone here? I drummed my fingers against the chip for mica. From somewhere in the back, I heard a soft thud, like a bag of something heavy hitting the floor. I tried not to think about what something heavy might be in the kitchen of a deserted diner. A figure appeared from the back room, casting a long, wavering shadow across the faded linoleum tiles. An old woman, heavy set, hair pulled into a messy gray bun. Her worn apron was smudged with something dark. Coffee? she asked, her voice harsh like sandpaper. She peered at me with squinting eyes that barely seemed to register my presence. Before I could reply, she had fetched a thick diner mug and was filling it with steaming black liquid. Menu two, please. I managed, trying to keep my tone light, but my instincts were screaming at me to get the hell out of there. The coffee was set down in front of me with a sharp clunk, and the woman shuffled away towards the kitchen, her footsteps disappearing into the back. I glanced at the coffee. It looked thick, almost sludgy. Unease battled with hunger and exhaustion. I was about to take a sip when something caught my eye, a dark smear across a booth behind me. When I looked closer, it was red. Not the bright red of ketchup, but a darker, duller red. Like old blood. Fear jolted through me like a live wire. In that instant, everything clicked into sharp focus the unnatural quiet, the sour smell, the woman's strange, vacant demeanor. I didn't bother standing. I threw myself away from the counter, knocking it with my hip. It wobbled, almost overturning, and I heard the woman turn sharply, her footsteps heavy and quick. I lunged for the door. It was locked. I slammed against it, my breath coming in panicked gasps. From behind me, I heard a slow, scraping sound, like metal dragged across the floor. Whipping around, I saw the woman step from the darkness of the kitchen. In her right hand was a long butcher knife, the blade dull and stained. She raised her left hand, revealing a chunk of raw meat, crimson and dripping. Her mouth opened in a slow, twisted grin, revealing rows of uneven teeth, far too many teeth for any human mouth. She took a step towards me, the knife held high, and then another. She let out a guttural hiss, her eyes rolling back until only the whites showed. Panic fueled me. I shouldered the door again, throwing all my weight against it. The old wood groaned in protest hinges squeaking. One more time, and maybe. Then I heard a loud crack, and the door burst outwards, sending me tumbling onto the gravel. A truck driver, a big guy with a thick beard, stood there, eyes wide. He must have heard the commotion, must have come to investigate. What the hell's going on here? The big guy roared, his voice booming through the stillness. I scrambled to my feet, never taking my eyes off the diner doorway. The woman stood there, frozen in the flickering neon light, the butcher knife dangling from her hand. 
She let out a frustrated growl, a sound more animal than human. Then, she turned and stumbled back into the darkness. The other driver and I stared at each other, heartbeats pounding in our ears. Jesus, he muttered, and I echoed the sentiment. My legs felt weak, adrenaline turning to jelly. We gotta call the cops, I managed to say. My phone trembled in my hand as I dialed 911, the dispatcher's voice barely audible over the buzzing in my ears. As I explained, the diner, the woman, the knife, the big guy peered cautiously into the diner. He let out a sharp curse. There's, there's stuff in here. You don't want to see. I didn't. I had a sick feeling in the pit of my stomach, a sense of deep, primal wrongness that had nothing to do with hunger and everything to do with survival. Sirens wailed in the distance, a lifeline cutting through the night. The big guy and I stood there in the dim glow of his truck's headlights, a shared silence descending on us. He didn't ask and I didn't volunteer any details. Sometimes, there are things better left unknown, especially after a close call. When the sheriff's deputies arrived, lights flashing, we stuck to our story, deserted diner, forced entry, strange woman. The cops searched the interior, emerging grim-faced, the shine of their flashlights picking up spatters of red across the walls and floor. One of them took my statement, eyes narrowed. You're lucky you got out when you did, he said, shaking his head, then lowering his voice. Place has a history, dark history. People gone missing around here for years. Never did figure it out. I nodded, jaw clenched. Missing people. My mind flickered to those uneven teeth, the blood-streaked apron. The realization hit me like a physical blow. No wonder she'd gone quiet when another trucker showed up. She'd gotten sloppy, desperate. And I'd nearly been her next catch. The investigation dragged on. They searched the surrounding woods, questioned the locals. All the usual protocol in a sleepy Oklahoma town where nothing much ever happened. Nothing this twisted, at least. I gave another statement, more detailed this time, omitting the part about the teeth. Sometimes, the less said, the better. They never found the woman, of course. And Millie's diner? It was shut down for good, the sign left to rust along the empty highway. But sometimes, at night, when I'm on a backwards route and tiredness claws at the edges of my vision— I think I see a flicker of movement out of the corner of my eye. A roadside stop promising food, promising rest. And I put my foot down and drive on. There are long stretches of highway in this country, vast and lonely, and some shadows are better left undisturbed. The aftermath stuck with me, heavier than any load I ever hauled. I went back to driving, because what else was I supposed to do? but the easy comfort of the road was gone. Every dingy diner, every flickering gas station sign brought a flash of memory, the woman's vacant stare, the slick of crimson on the floor. My daughter kept me going, gave me something to hold on to. Every other weekend I'd pick her up, and she'd chatter about school, about her friends, about a thousand normal things that kids her age think about. And for those precious hours, I could almost convince myself that the world outside my truck was safe, was sane. But that night clung to me like a lingering scent of grease and old blood. There's a breed of fear that lives in the pit of your stomach, a cold knot of what-ifs and what-could-have-beens. That fear pushed me to get out from behind the wheel after a couple of years. It wasn't the life I'd known, or the life I'd wanted. But it was one where I didn't sleep with one eye open, didn't taste metal in the back of my throat with each new town, each deserted stretch of road. I found work in the warehouse. It's dull, monotonous. Doesn't pay as well, 
and there isn't even a whiff of adventure. But it's safe. It's predictable. No neon flickers, no lonely highways. And most importantly, no unexplained thuds from darkened back rooms. That, I discovered, is worth more to me than all the wide-open spaces in the world. My name is Jack, and this happened to me back in 2005. I've been driving the long-haul routes for most of my adult life. I like the open road, the way the miles just eat away your worries. Or that's how it used to be. See, my wife passed a couple of years back. Cancer came on fast, left me and our boy reeling. Driving, that was all I knew how to do, so I kept on doing it trying to keep a roof over our heads. This particular run had me all the way out in Arizona. The desert has a strange beauty to it, but it can turn on you quick. The unrelenting sun, the stretches with nothing but scrub and sand. That kind of isolation can play tricks on the mind. The AC in my truck was busted, making the heat even more unbearable. It was one of those late summer evenings, sun dipping low and painting the sky in streaks of orange and red. I was scanning the radio for something, anything, to break the monotony when I caught a fuzzy signal. A local station, playing old country tunes. Figured that was good enough. As the music crackled through the speakers, an ad came on, advertising a place called The Tumbleweed Saloon. Cold beer, live music, best steak west of the Pecos. Sounded like just what I needed. And if the country tunes were anything to go by, the crowd wouldn't be too rowdy. I signaled a turn and took the exit, eager for a drink and some air-conditioned comfort. The road wound through low hills, the desert stretching out all around me. The only sign of life was the occasional, twisted cactus. The further I drove, the more a sense of unease settled over me. Then, I saw it up ahead, a ramshackle building perched on the side of the road, an old wooden sign hanging askew. The Tumbleweed Saloon. Had it looked like that in the ad? I couldn't be sure, but it seemed off. There was a peeling paint job that the desert sun had bleached to a pale, sun-washed pink and only a few dusty pickups parked in the gravel lot. Not exactly the thriving country bar I'd imagined. The heat hit me like a wall as I stepped out of my truck. My shirt was already sticking to my skin. But I'd come this far, so I figured I might as well get that cold beer. The place was just as faded on the inside, scuffed wooden floors, a chip bar counter, ripped vinyl booths. Only two other customers were inside, a weathered cowboy type in the corner, and a guy by the window that I couldn't quite make out. A woman appeared from the back room, a cigarette dangling from her lips. She was older, with stringy dyed blonde hair and a face wrinkled like an old boot. What'll it be? She barked in a voice made raspy by years of smoke. Beer coldest you got. I managed, and gestured towards the empty bar. That seat free? The woman grunted something between a yes and a no, and turned away, shuffling back towards a rusted old fridge behind the bar. As she fetched my drink, I looked out the grimy window. The other guy had turned his head, and I saw his face in profile. Thin, gaunt, with sunken eyes and shadowed sockets. He caught my stare and gave a slow, unnerving smile, a flash of yellowed teeth, too many teeth for any normal mouth. A chill ran through me, and I looked away, focusing intently on the condensation forming on my beer. I heard the clink of glass on the bar and reached for my drink. That's when the music cut off abruptly, replaced by a scraping noise a low rhythmic dragging sound coming from somewhere deeper in the saloon. The cowboy in the corner stood up suddenly, 
knocking his chair back. I ain't staying here, he muttered and headed for the door. He threw a fistful of bills on the counter and stomped out into the dying sunlight. I turned toward the woman. Maybe it was nothing. Maybe some busted equipment in the kitchen. Something wrong with the music? I asked, trying to keep my voice casual. She shook her head, those dead eyes fixed on me. Just ignore it. Be over soon. Her voice had a flat, lifeless quality that sent another shiver down my spine. That rasping, dragging sound continued, and then I heard something else. Muffled yelling. Shrieks cut short. I set my beer down, untouched. This place, it wasn't right. Acting on instinct, I headed to the back, the part of the bar the woman had emerged from earlier. The scuffling noises were louder now. As I got closer, a sickly sweet smell hit me, a metallic undertone like copper pennies. It reminded me of, of, the hospital when my wife. I pushed open the swinging door into whatever lay beyond. The sight stopped me in my tracks. It wasn't a kitchen, but some kind of crude storage room. And on the floor, the cowboy from earlier lay sprawled in a pool of crimson, his eyes wide with terror. The man by the window, the one with the unnerving smile, stood over the cowboy. Except, he didn't look quite the same. His skin, already sallow, had gone an unhealthy gray pallor. And he, he was taller now, lanky limbs moving in jerky, uneven strides as he turned towards me. His face, it had changed. Distended, jaw unnaturally wide, revealing those rows of teeth, far too many, far too sharp. And his eyes, they were pits of darkness, devoid of anything human. My mind froze, then kicked into survival mode. I turned and ran, shoving past the woman who still stood behind the bar. As I burst through the front door, I heard a guttural shriek and the sound of splintering wood. The desert stretched before me, the sun painting the dunes in an eerie blood-red light as it set. The only sound was my own panicked breathing and the pounding of my heart against my ribs. That thing was behind me, gaining, and with each step the scrapes and shuffles grew louder. Fear propelled me onward, my muscles burning, my lungs screaming for air. Up ahead I saw my salvation, my truck, parked where I'd left it. With renewed desperation I surged forward. My keys jangled in my sweaty hand, the sound seeming impossibly loud in the desert stillness. I fumbled them into the lock, yanked the door open, and threw myself inside. My fingers trembled as I slammed the truck into gear and stomped on the accelerator. It squealed against the gravel, throwing up a cloud of dust as I sped back towards the highway. A glance in the rearview mirror confirmed my worst nightmares. The thing was loping out of the saloon, an unnatural blur of ragged movement across the sand. Its eyes, those soulless black pits, fixed on my truck. As I hit the highway, I put the pedal to the floor. Even topped out, I knew it wouldn't be enough. Every time I looked back, the thing was closer, its gangly limbs propelling it across the desert with horrifying speed. My mind raced. Was there a town up ahead? A gas station, anything? Maybe I could find help. The headlights flickered then died. Darkness enveloped me, broken only by the dim glow of the dashboard. Of course. With the busted A.C., the engine must have overheated. And I was miles from nowhere, a sitting duck for whatever that thing back there wanted. From behind me, I heard a scrape, a raking of claws against metal. I squeezed my eyes shut, bracing myself. Any second, it would rip through the roof, shred through metal and bone, those inhuman jaws clamping down. Tires screeched. I dared to open my eyes. 
A pair of headlights pierce the darkness ahead of me, another semi, a massive bulk of metal barreling along the highway. Waving my arms wildly, I flagged the truck down, not caring if the driver thought I was crazy. He slammed on the brakes, throwing open the door. I scrambled inside, babbling incoherently about the saloon, the monster. The other driver, a grizzled, no-nonsense type named Hank, listened with a frown. He took a long, hard look at me, at my panicked rambling, and reached for his CB radio. A minute later, his rough voice crackled through the static. Anyone get a copy out there? Strange happenings near some old saloon about twenty miles back. Better call it in. A wave of relief washed over me. Help was coming. Whatever nightmare had played out at that godforsaken saloon, it would be investigated. They'd find the cowboy, they'd realize this wasn't some animal attack. We didn't find out what happened that night until weeks later. State troopers went out to the tumbleweed saloon responding to Hank's call. The place was deserted. No bodies, no sign of struggle, no trace of the woman or the inhuman creature that had stalked me through the desert. Officially, the cowboy was listed as a missing person, another victim swallowed by the vastness of the Arizona wilderness. Unofficially, a few of the troopers exchanged uneasy looks, Stories of disappearances along that stretch of highway whispering among the locals. I went back to driving, but the open road wasn't my sanctuary anymore. Every flickering neon sign, every darkened backroom, held the potential for horror. The memory of that night never faded. The sickly sweet smell, the dead eyes of the creature, the knowledge that there are things out there existing on the edges of our understanding— Eventually, I gave up the long hauls. Found myself a job managing a warehouse monotonous, safe, predictable. There are days when I miss the solitude of the highway, the feeling of the big rig humming beneath my hands. But then, I remember the blood-soaked floor of that ramshackle saloon and the inhuman shape loping across the desert. And I know, the warehouse, the endless rows of boxes— the four solid walls, they might be the only thing keeping the darkness at bay. My name is Tom, and this happened to me back in 97. Trucking suited me better back then. It was a solitary life, sure, but there was a kind of freedom to the open road a rhythm to the miles that felt good. Now, I'm not the religious type, but seeing the sun rise over the vast Texas plains, it could make you feel small in a way that wasn't bad, you know? Like there were forces that work bigger than yourself, bigger than those petty arguments you have at rest stops over the last stale donut. This particular run, I was hauling construction supplies over to El Paso, I'd picked up the load in Dallas, and it was already mid-afternoon by the time I crossed into the Texas Panhandle. That stretch of interstate can be a real beast, flat, dusty, and unforgiving under the relentless sun. My only real company was the radio, and it wasn't much help, either preachers yelling about repentance or cheesy love songs. I settled on a local station with a fuzzy signal. At least they played some old-timey country tunes. As dusk approached, the first pangs of hunger started to kick in. Usually, I'd plan ahead, but this job had come up last minute, and I just grabbed whatever snacks were left in my cab. I started debating whether to tough it out until El Paso or pull off for a proper meal. It was then that I spotted the sign, its neon glow flickering through the gathering twilight. The dusty spur steaks, spirits, and cold beer five miles. Stomach ruled over sense. Five miles felt like nothing after the hundreds already put behind me. That steak sounded real good right about now. 
I took the next exit and followed the road as it wound through scrub brush and low hills. The dusty spur appeared seemingly out of nowhere, a squat building perched on the side of a desolate dirt road. It looked like the set of some old western film, whether it would bleach by the sun, a lopsided porch, and a rusty hitching post out front. Something gave me pause. Maybe it was the quiet, the sense of stillness as I pulled my truck into the empty gravel parking lot. Ignoring the unease, I pushed through the swinging saloon-style doors. Inside, it was every bit as rundown as it appeared outside. The air hung thick with stale cigarette smoke and something else, a slightly sour smell that I couldn't place. A few locals sat hunched at the bar, throwing back shots with an intensity that didn't bode well. A burly man with a thick neck and handlebar mustache stood behind the counter. He barely glanced up as I walked in. Just passing through. You still serving food? My voice bounced off the walls in the thick silence. The bartender grunted and gestured to a table in the back. The place was dim, with only a few flickering lamps casting pools of orange light. As I settled into a sticky wooden booth, a woman emerged from the back, carrying a chipped, stained menu and a dented metal pitcher of water. She was young, early twenties at the most with a face that seemed too pretty for a place like this. Her dark hair was pulled back into a messy braid, and she wore a faded blue waitress uniform that looked like it had seen better days. There was a flicker of something in her eyes when she met mine, a flash of fear quickly veiled behind a forced smile. Her smile widened unnaturally, revealing far too many teeth. You look hungry! We got the best ribs west of the Mississippi. Her voice was hoarse, as if she'd been yelling all day. Maybe those guys at the bar had kept her busy. I scanned the menu, greasy, predictable fare. Still, that steak had sounded good when I was miles away. I'll have the steak, then. Medium rare, if you can. The woman jotted down the order and turned to go but I stopped her. You mind if I ask where the restroom is? A wary look crossed her face. Back of the kitchen. Only one we got. She didn't wait for a reply, disappearing into the smoky back room before I could finish my question. I pushed out of the booth and walked towards the back, the unsteady creaking of the floorboards echoing in the silence. The corridor was pitch black and I fumbled along the wall, searching for a light switch. My hands found only rough wood and cobwebs, a sense of claustrophobia starting to set in. As my eyes adjusted, I finally noticed a faint sliver of light spilling from under a door at the end of the hall. Something was seriously off about this place. Turning the doorknob, I peered inside. It wasn't the restroom but a kind of cluttered storage area, stacked with old boxes, rusted tools, and discarded furniture. And there, crouched in a shadowy corner, was the woman. She was huddled on the floor, shaking, tears streaming down her face. Before I could react, she bolted past me, hurtling down the hallway. I heard a commotion, then a man's angry shout. Footsteps pounded towards me. He loomed in the doorway, the handlebar mustached bartender, his face red with rage. Ain't no place for nosy drivers, he growled, the stench of stale liquor rolling off him in waves. His right hand was hidden behind his back. That's when I saw the blood stain on his apron, a dark splatter spreading across the faded denim. Instinct kicked in. I backed up, hands raised. Listen, buddy, just a misunderstanding. I thought that was the restroom. My voice trailed off, a sickening realization dawning. The sour smell, the girl's tear-streaked face, the remote location. It all clicked into terrifying focus. The bartender lunged forward. 
In the dim light, I caught the glint of metal in his hand, a butcher's knife, long and sharp. My blood ran cold. This trip wasn't just about delivering building supplies, it was about becoming one of them. Survival instinct propelled me into action. I dodged his clumsy swing, the rusty blade just grazing my arm. Pain seared up my side. Time seemed to slow. I couldn't go back towards the front. There'd be nowhere to run in the open barroom. The back exit, the kitchen, wherever the woman had fled, that was my only chance. I barreled into the storage room, slamming the door behind me. The flimsy latch wouldn't hold for long. I scanned the room frantically, my gaze falling on a rusty old axe propped against the wall. Crude, but it was better than nothing. In the same moment, I heard the splintering of wood as the makeshift lock gave way. He stood in the doorway, breathing heavily. He lunged forward, and I swung the axe in a desperate arc. It connected, thudding into his shoulder with sickening force. He let out a roar of pain, staggering back. I pressed my advantage, swinging again. The axe bit deep, blood spurting in a crimson arc. With a blood-curdling scream, he lost his balance and tumbled to the floor. I hovered above him, the axe raised, my breath coming in ragged gasps. His eyes, wide with a mix of rage and fear, stared up at me. For a moment, time hung suspended. I could end this, right here, right now. But something held me back. I wasn't a killer. Not yet. My eyes flitted to the open doorway behind him. I didn't need to kill him. I just needed to escape. Turning my back on the bloodied man, I burst out of the room and into the corridor. Somewhere ahead, a door banged open. Run! The woman's voice, ragged and urgent. She stood framed in the back doorway, the fading light of the setting sun silhouetting her slight form. Her eyes shone with grim determination. I sprinted toward her. Behind us, we heard the enraged bellow of the injured butcher as he scrambled to his feet. Adrenaline pumping, we ran across the gravel lot, dodging between parked cars. The woman reached her vehicle, an ancient pickup truck, the keys already dangling from the ignition. She flung the door open, gesturing for me to get in. I piled into the passenger seat, and she slammed the truck into gear. The engine roared to life, tires spitting gravel as we lurched forward. A glance over my shoulder revealed the butcher, bloody and enraged, lurching towards us, the knife still clutched in a meaty fist. His shouts faded as we sped down the dirt road, dust billowing in our wake. We didn't stop until we hit the interstate again. The woman pulled over, slumping back against the seat, her breath coming in harsh sobs. She was covered in dust, a bruise forming on her cheekbone. You all right? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. She wiped her eyes with the back of her hand. He keeps me locked up. Makes me serve the customers. Just waiting for the right moment. What about those men at the bar? Her face hardened. They know. They're part of it. Drifters, guys passing through, nobody comes looking for them. A wave of nausea washed over me. I hadn't just stumbled upon a bad meal. I'd nearly become one. We sat in silence for a long time, watching the sun disappear completely below the horizon. What about the cops? I finally asked. She turned the key in the ignition, the old engine sputtering in protest. The nearest proper station's an hour away. You sure they'd even believe a story like this? Her voice was bitter, filled with the weight of experience. I thought of the butcher back at the dusty spur, perhaps still alive, his rage festering. We both knew that going to the authorities was a gamble. What evidence did we have, 
besides a hysterical woman with bruises and a blood-soaked axe. And deep down, something gnawed at me. Justice would mean scrutiny, questions, the whole ordeal dragged back into the light. No matter the outcome, part of me just wanted to put those lonely miles behind me, to let the whole thing fade into a dark blur in the rearview mirror. We drove through the night, the headlights carving a path across the vast, empty plains. Some time before dawn, we stopped at a roadside diner, one of those generic places with a brightly lit sign and a parking lot full of other semis. The woman vanished into the restroom. I stood by the truck, watching the horizon begin to lighten, the weight of the past night settling over me. When she emerged, she'd cleaned up as best she could, a faded purple bruise visible along her jawline. I'm heading north, she said softly. Somewhere far away from here. I nodded. Drive safe. She climbed into the truck and started the engine. With a final wave, the battered pickup truck rumbled onto the highway, disappearing into the dawn. I climbed back into my rig and fired up the engine. El Paso lay hundreds of miles ahead. There was a load to deliver, a schedule to keep, the familiar rhythm of the road waiting. But beneath the steady hum of the engine, I felt a lingering disquiet. There would always be another roadside diner, another remote saloon. And the memory of the girl, of the desperate flight through the desert night, would haunt the open road forever. My name's Marcus, and this happened to me back in 2010. I've been driving the long-haul routes for longer than I care to count. There's something about the open road that calls to a certain type of person, I think. Liking your own company helps. My wife passed a few years back, leaving me with the house and our old dog, Murphy. The miles help keep the loneliness at bay. Most of the time. This particular run had me hauling a load of industrial supplies down to Florida. I'd picked up the rig in Nashville, already starting to feel the heat and humidity clinging to me as I crossed into Georgia. The AC in my truck had been on the fritz for weeks, making for a sweaty, miserable drive. I decided to push on until sundown at least, hoping to find a rest stop with shade where I could park and maybe catch a few hours of sleep before reaching the coast. In the fading light... I started keeping an eye out for a suitable spot to pull over. The signs just kept promising attractions and gas stations miles in the distance. Just as I was about to give up and resign myself to another night of sweating in the cab, I saw a billboard looming ahead, the paint faded and peeling. Billy's Oasis Motel and Diner, two miles, cold drinks, hot meals, affordable rates. It didn't sound fancy, but the promise of a chilled drink was almost enough to make me weep. I signaled the exit, a narrow two-lane road disappearing into the trees. After two miles of dense Georgia pines, Billy's oasis appeared on the right side of the road. It was just as the billboard advertised, a rundown motel, the neon buzzing off and on and a dusty diner with a few weather-beaten picnic tables outside. But hey, at least it looked deserted. A quick scan of the parking lot showed a single rusty pickup truck and a beat-up motorcycle. Perfect. I wouldn't have to socialize. I parked as far away from the other vehicles as the lot permitted. Murphy whined from the passenger seat, eager to stretch his legs so I clipped on his leash and opened the door for him. As he hopped down, he let loose a disgruntled bark, as if picking up on a vibe only dogs can sense. All right, old-timer, we'll just be in and out, I said more to reassure myself than my dog. Pushing through the diner door, I was greeted with dim lighting and the stale smell of old fryer grease. A bell fixed above the door jangled, 
announcing my presence. A figure appeared from somewhere in the back, a tall, lanky man probably in his late fifties, with stringy hair and a vacant, distant look in his eyes. You folks open? I called out, surveying the deserted booths and the chipped counter. The man gave a slow nod. His lips twitched, forming what I think was meant to be a smile. It had the opposite effect on me, sending a shiver down my spine. We got food rooms. What'll it be? His voice was rough, disused. Just a drink. Iced tea if you got it. I glanced over at Murphy, who was sniffing hopefully at the swinging kitchen door, probably picking up on the scent of burgers. And maybe a bowl of water for the dog here. The man shuffled behind the counter and rooted around in a rusted fridge. Eventually, he produced a sweating glass and a chipped china bowl. He filled them both from a plastic pitcher on the counter. The iced tea had a cloudy residue and the water looked murky, but I wasn't about to complain. Murphy, bless his indiscriminate doggy heart, lapped the water down happily. I paid, and the man gave me another one of those unsettling smiles, the kind that don't reach the eyes. As I walked out, I realized he hadn't said a word since I'd walked in. The whole place just fell off, like I'd stumbled into a movie set where something sinister was about to go down. Murphy seemed to be picking up on the vibe too, pulling at his leash to get back to the truck. We hustled back across the lot, the darkness of the surrounding woods seeming more oppressive, more observant all of a sudden. I could just make out the shape of the lanky man in the diner's doorway, staring out at us. A prickle of unease ran down my spine. As soon as I got back in the truck, I fired it up. I didn't even care about finding shade anymore. I just wanted to put some distance between myself and Billy's oasis. I drove through the night, pulling up at a crowded truck stop at around 3 a.m. for a few hours of fitful rest. When I woke up, the sun was high and the world had mostly righted itself. But the memory of that empty diner and its strange, silent occupant lingered. Later on the CB, I overheard some other truckers chatting about backroads, local stops. Anyone been to Billy's Oasis lately? One crackly voice inquired. There was a pause, then someone else chimed in, his voice tinged with dark amusement. Not since Billy up and disappeared a couple years back. They say his wife took off, and old Billy went a little, well, not right in the head, if you catch my drift. Someone else chuckled. Place has been empty since. Some folks say it's haunted by Billy. Guess some part of him stayed behind. There were a few more jokes, the name Billy tossed around casually like he was some kind of ghost story. But I knew what I'd seen and I couldn't shake the feeling that whoever, or whatever, was running Billy's oasis was still watching me drive away. My name's Frank, and this happened to me back in 98. I'd been hauling freight for a good 15 years by then prided myself on knowing the interstates like the back of my hand. But sometimes, a shortcut tempts you, especially when the clock's running and you just want to get home to your own bed. This particular trip, I was carrying a load of textiles from North Carolina down to Tampa. Nothing exciting, but the pay was steady. Cutting across South Carolina... I saw one of those brown signs pointing towards a historic site some old Civil War battleground. Figured I could stretch my legs, learn a little something. Sometimes, those forgotten places have a halfway decent diner tucked away nearby. The road wound through pine forests and scrub, then opened up to this old, overgrown field. 
A few monuments dotted the landscape and some other plaques described the battle in way more historical detail than I cared for. Thing was, I couldn't spot any sign of a diner, or much of anything besides trees and the fading remnants of a dirt road. As I turned to head back to the truck, I saw something flicker at the far edge of the woods. Someone standing there, just at the tree line. Tall fella, dressed in faded jeans and a flannel shirt, like a lumberjack out of some old storybook. Didn't seem right, that kind of get-up for the South Carolina heat, even in fall. A friendly wave seemed like the neighborly thing to do, but the man just stared back, unmoving. Something was off about the way he was standing, rigid and unnatural. A chill went down my spine. It wasn't fear exactly, more like a primal sense of wrongness that made the hairs on my arms stand on end. I turned and walked a little faster back to my truck, that feeling of being watched clinging to me. As I was pulling back onto the highway, I glanced into my rearview mirror. The man was still there, unnaturally still, his outline stark against the trees. I put my foot down, eager to leave that deserted battlefield behind. Back on the highway, I tried to shake it off. Just some local oddball, maybe a history buff playing dress-up on his day off. Still, the sight of him lingered in my mind, that unblinking stare, his skin oddly pale in the fading sunlight. Later that evening, I pulled into a truck stop for fuel and a bite to eat. Needing to clear my head, I decided to strike up a conversation with another driver while waiting in line for the restrooms. The guy looked about my age, tired eyes, trucker's cap pulled low. You come up through 95? I asked casually, figuring it was a safe opener. He grunted. Nah, took a detour. Always try to avoid the big roads when I can. Place you recommend around here? I pressed, a touch of curiosity mixed with unease gnawing at me. He hesitated, then spat a wad of tobacco juice into a crumpled soda can. Well, he drawled, there's this old battleground off a back road. Real eerie place, they say. A cold wave washed over me. He must have seen something register on my face, because he gave me a long, scrutinizing look. You seen something strange out there? He lowered his voice, a hint of a smirk playing around his lips. Folks talk about a fella who wanders the grounds. Civil War soldier, they reckon. Some say he never knew the war was over, still guarding his post. My stomach lurched. I could hear my own pulse pounding in my ears. Nah, just some guy standing by the trees, I muttered, trying to sound nonchalant. The other trucker shrugged. Could be him. Could be just some local with too much time on his hands. Either way, place gave me the creeps. I ain't stopping there again. After another awkward pause, he nodded and went on his way. I stumbled through the rest of the evening in a daze. Was the driver just messing with me? Or was there something more to this tale, something I'd stumbled across out there in that remote battlefield? That night, I didn't sleep well. In my dreams, I saw the man from the woods, his face contorted into an expression of inhuman rage, his eyes burning holes in the darkness. I woke up in a sweat, heart pounding. Logic demanded I put it behind me, a weird encounter, an overactive imagination, nothing more. Yet I couldn't shake the feeling I wasn't done with that desolate battlefield. The next day, as I neared my delivery in Tampa, the memory of that unmoving figure gnawed at me. It wasn't about bravery, some misguided need to solve a mystery. It was about unease, about a disruption in the natural order I was used to. Turning the rig around, I headed north. I had to see that place again, this time in the clear light of day. Driving back through South Carolina, I found the same turnoff, the same weather-beaten sign. 
This time, under the harsh glare of the midday sun, the battlefield looked less eerie, just an unkempt field with some old markers. But as I walked towards the tree line, my unease returned tenfold. And then I saw it, a crudely built lean to nestled amongst the trees. Outside, scraps of old fabric, faded and stained, were draped over branches, offering scant protection from the elements. An empty campfire ring sat in the center of the clearing, and something else, a glint of metal half buried in the dirt. I reached down and pulled, an old rusted bayonet, its blade chipped and pitted. A cold certainty washed over me. Whatever I had seen the day before hadn't been a figment of my imagination, hadn't been some Civil War reenactor. This was real, and whatever was haunting this place, it wasn't at rest. I dropped the bayonet like it had burned me. Turning, I started back toward my truck, trying to calm my racing thoughts. There had to be a reasonable explanation. Maybe some homeless guy had set up a makeshift camp. It was far-fetched, sure, but it had to be better than the alternative, that I'd stumbled across some kind of ghost story made flesh. Just before reaching the tree line, I heard it, the crack of a branch breaking underfoot. I spun around, heart pounding in my chest. There he was again, the man from the woods, just a few yards away. This time I got a clearer look at him. His skin had a grayish pallor, his eyes sunk deep in their sockets, rimmed with dark circles. His clothes hung loosely on his gaunt frame, like he hadn't eaten in weeks. He looked like a walking corpse. Leave, he rasped, his voice barely above a whisper. And beneath that whisper lurked a hint of malice, of something deeply, unnaturally wrong. I stumbled backwards. Look, I don't want any trouble. I was just leaving. I held my hands up, some half-baked attempt to show I wasn't a threat. He took a halting step forward, and I caught a whiff of something foul, the stench of decay, of rot clinging to him. This is my place, he croaked, taking another step. Desperation fueled a surge of adrenaline. I bolted for the truck, fumbling for my keys in a panic. I heard him behind me, his ragged breaths growing louder. I couldn't outrun him for long. I had to think. My truck keys slipped from my sweaty hands, bouncing maddeningly under the front seat. I swore, dropping down and fishing blindly for them. The door of the truck burst open. A skeletal hand reached inside, clawing at my legs. Panic and revulsion pushed me over the edge. I kicked out wildly, catching him in the shin. He roared in pain, a feral, inhuman sound. I grabbed the keys and scrambled into the driver's seat, slamming the door and locking it just as he lunged again, his decaying face smashing against the window. I fumbled the key into the ignition, the engine sputtering to life. Throwing the truck into reverse, I stomped on the accelerator. The tires spun, kicking up dirt, and then the truck lurched backwards. I saw him fall, scrambling to his feet. I didn't look back as I tore out of the field and barreled back onto the deserted road. Through the rearview mirror, I saw his figure shrinking, growing indistinct against the backdrop of the field and the ragged trees. Hours passed in a blur. Eventually, with the sun beginning to set, I pulled into a gas station. Needing to steady my frayed nerves, I went inside. At the counter, trying to act casual, I asked for a coffee and a pack of cigarettes. Anything interesting in the local news? I said, attempting to keep my voice steady. The cashier looked up from his phone, eyes glazed with boredom. Nah, quiet around here these days. Hey, you look a little, peaked. Everything all right, mister? I forced a weak laugh. Just a long drive. 
Paying for the coffee, I scan the store's dusty shelves for anything that could serve as a weapon, a tire iron, a hammer, anything. My gaze fell on a coil of heavy-duty rope. Impulsively, I grabbed it, the thick coils giving me a small sense of security. Back at my truck, I fueled up, then found a secluded corner of the parking lot where I wouldn't be easily seen. I took the rope and, with trembling hands, fashioned a crude noose, several feet in diameter. Then I waited. As darkness fell, I saw headlights cutting across the far end of the lot. An old, rusted pickup approach, kicking up a cloud of dust. It was him. The pickup circled slowly, its headlights briefly illuminating my rig. It pulled up alongside my truck, and the driver's side window rolled down. The decaying face leered out at me in the dim light. Nowhere left to run, he rasped, and something akin to a smile spread across his rotting lips. He revved the pickup's engine menacingly. My plan wasn't brilliant, more an act of desperation than strategy. Opening the driver's side door just a crack, I tossed the noose of rope out, aiming for the pickup's front bumper. It landed short. I swore under my breath and tried again. This time, the rope snaked over the bumper and hooked on. He must have seen my clumsy attempts and let out a throaty chuckle. The pickup lurched forward, tightening the rope. I slammed my door shut and locked it just as the rope pulled taut. My truck jolted forward then stalled. The old pickup strained against the rope, its engine roaring. I braced myself, ready for the rope to snap, to be dragged across the asphalt. But the rope, surprisingly, held. Instead, I heard the squealing of tires. His pickup was spinning its wheels, losing traction on the gravel. Seizing the moment, I gunned my engine, throwing the truck into reverse. With a deafening screech of metal on metal, I dragged the pickup backwards. I shifted into drive and slammed on the accelerator. The pickup, caught between our two vehicles, jolted violently as its rusty frame began to buckle and twist. He screamed an inhuman scream, then the side window of his truck shattered. He scrambled to free himself, but it was too late. The pickup crumpled under the force, pinning him inside the twisted wreck. I kept driving, dragging the deformed metal mass until we were clear of the gas station lights. Only then did I pull over. I stumbled out of my truck and vomited onto the cracked asphalt. After a few moments, when I could stand again, I cautiously approached the wrecked pickup. Inside, the man was still, his ruined body slumped against the steering wheel, his neck bent at an impossible angle. His vacant eyes stared sightlessly at the night sky. I stood there, shivering in the aftermath. Would anyone believe this wild tale? Would the cops even care about some drifter, likely undocumented and on the fringe of society, found crushed in a remote field? I had no way to explain the campsite, the rot, the impossible strength, none of it. In the end, the most practical course of action wastes most callous. Walk away. I drove through the night, never stopping, putting miles between myself and that desolate field until both were nothing more than a nightmarish blur in the rearview mirror. Eventually, I made it to Tampa, delivered my textiles, and got back on the road. But something had shifted in me. The open highway, once a symbol of freedom, felt oppressive. Every truck stop, every darkened roadside, held the potential for the uncanny to seep into the world. That was years ago, and I'm no longer an over-the-road trucker. I found work driving shorter routes, sticking to well-traveled roads. Some nights those empty eyes still haunt my dreams, and the smell of decay lingers on the edge of my memory. I never told anyone what happened back there, that it was more than just some tragic accident. No one would believe me anyways, 
and would it even matter in the end? That man, whatever he was, is gone, and the old battleground keeps its secrets. My name is Sam, and this happened to me back in 2016. I'm what you'd call a long hauler, and I take pride in knowing the interstates like the back of my hand. But sometimes, a detour seems tempting, especially after too many hours staring at the same asphalt. Maybe a roadside diner with greasy food and strong coffee, you know the type. I don't drink much myself, but sometimes you gotta unwind after a long shift. This particular run had me hauling electronics from California to Florida. Summer was in full swing, and crossing the Arizona desert at night seemed like the lesser of two evils when compared to melting in traffic jams. The vast emptiness had a kind of calming effect after a day spent battling rush hour. Somewhere near the New Mexico border, fatigue and the steady hum of the engine started to play tricks on me. I figured it was time to find a spot to pull over for a few hours' rest. Just off the interstate, I saw one of those weathered signs for a gas station and motel. Nothing fancy, but the flickering neon promised a vacancy, and that was all I really cared about. The place had a faded, forgotten air about it the kind of spot you only end up at out of desperation. It was called the Sunset Vista Motel, ironic, considering the only view was scrubland and distant mesas. The motel office smelled of stale cigarettes and lemon-scented cleaning products. A woman with tired eyes and hair the color of old ropes sat behind the counter reading a doggered paperback. I asked for a room, paid in cash, and got a key that had probably been around since the Eisenhower administration. Room 12 was on the ground floor, its paint peeling, with threadbare curtains that didn't quite block out the harsh desert sun. But hey, it had a bed. I figured a few hours of sleep, and I'd be back on the road. Before dropping my bag, I opened the mini-fridge to grab a bottle of water. That's when I saw it. Scrawled and dried, brownish-red on the inside of the fridge door was the word. RUN! Underneath, there was a crude drawing, a stick figure hanging from a noose. My stomach lurched. Was this some dumb prank? A housekeeping oversight? Or something more sinister? I tried shaking off the unease. The heat was probably getting to me. After all, I was in the middle of nowhere with an overactive imagination. Just needed a shower, a few hours of shut-eye and those ominous fridge messages would fade into distant, half-remembered nightmares. With a forced laugh, I slammed the fridge door shut. It was a little too late for any of that. The shower ran lukewarm and did little to wash away the feeling of wrongness that had settled over me. When I finally collapsed on the stained bedspread, exhaustion battled a growing sense of dread. As I drifted off, I thought I heard footsteps outside my room. But I chalked it up to sleep deprivation and paranoia. I woke up with a start in the pitch blackness of a desert night. The room was stifling. The A.C. had quit working. Something scratched at the window, like a branch clawing against the glass. My heart thudded against my ribs. That's when I saw the light, a faint flickering underneath the door and the smell, like something burning. Fire! A muffled voice yelled from somewhere down the hallway. Fear jolted me into action. I grabbed my keys and wallet, stumbling to the door. It was already getting hot to the touch. I threw the door open and was hit with a blast of heat and smoke. The hallway was an inferno. Flames roared and debris rained down from the ceiling. At the far end, the figure of the woman from the motel office staggered through the haze, screaming. I had no time to consider my options. 
The front was blocked, and the fire was spreading fast. My only chance was to break the window and climb out the back. Coughing, I lunged across the smoke-filled room and shoved at the window frame. It wouldn't budge. Panic choked my throat. Was it painted shut? Had they done this on purpose? Desperation fueled the final, frantic push. The window pane shattered, and I scrambled outside, scraping my arms on jagged shards of glass. I supped in lungfuls of fresh night air, my skin prickling from a mix of adrenaline and the heat of the blaze. It was only then I noticed the figure standing behind the motel. Silhouetted against the raging fire, it was more shadow than human, with an elongated neck and a head that hung at an impossible angle. As the motel roof started to collapse, the figure simply stared, unmoving, those burning holes where eyes should have been fixated on me. And then, from somewhere in the collapsing building, a woman screamed, her voice cut off as the roof caved in. I ran. Ran past the burning shell of the motel, through the desert night, ignoring the sharp stabs of stones against my bare feet. My lungs burned, my pulse pounding in my ears. Had they set the fire on purpose? Some sick insurance scam? Or some deranged ritual meant to feed whatever that shadowy thing was? When I finally stumbled across the interstate, it was nearly dawn. I flagged down a semi and the driver, wide-eyed and shocked at my appearance, helped me inside. I barely remember the rest of that nightmarish drive to the next town. I couldn't get the image of the hanging figure out of my mind, or the woman's final scream before the flames swallowed her whole. And the chilling realization, the fire, the message in the fridge, it could have been me. Maybe calling the cops crossed my mind. But without proof, what would I tell them? That some boogeyman with a neck like a broken tree lured me to a roadside death trap? They'd probably lock me up instead. My name's Joe, and this happened to me back in 09. Trucking was good to me back then. I had a steady route up and down the East Coast, not glamorous or anything, but it paid the bills and kept me close to my wife and kids. And hey, I'm not the type of guy to complain. You get behind the wheel long enough, you learn to appreciate the little things. A hot cup of diner coffee, a clear stretch of highway. But this story, this story changed everything. It was early fall, mild enough that I didn't mind cracking the window to let some crisp air in. This particular run was taking me from New York down to Virginia with a load of construction supplies. Around sunset, somewhere deep in Pennsylvania, I started to notice a dull ache behind my eyes. Nothing a couple of aspirin and a rest stop break wouldn't handle. When I spotted a sign for a place called Willow Creek Diner coming up, I made the decision to pull over. The diner sat at the top of a slight incline, overlooking a stretch of forest. Inside, it was the stuff of postcards, checkered tile floor, gleaming chrome stools at the counter. A couple of truckers sat huddled in a booth, and a waitress with weary eyes topped off their coffee mugs. She gave me a tired smile and tossed a menu on the counter as I slid into a seat. Before ordering, I excused myself to the restroom. When I came back to my seat, I nearly jumped out of my skin. Sitting directly across from me was a man. Must have snuck in while I was gone. He wasn't wearing a trucker's uniform. A stained flannel shirt was draped over his lanky frame and a worn baseball cap hid most of his face. There was something twitchy about the way he sat, an energy that made my hair stand on end. His eyes, glinting beneath the cap's brim, held a predatory intensity. A shiver of unease went down my spine. You new here? 
His voice was a rusty rasp, sending a primal shiver of fear through me. Just passing through. I mumbled, trying to sound casual. He barked out a laugh, a sound devoid of any warmth. We all just passing through, ain't we? Passing through till we ain't. I forced a weak smile and flagged down the waitress, avoiding his gaze as I hastily ordered the cheapest thing on the menu. When the food arrived, it sat untouched on the plate in front of me, congealing under the harsh fluorescent lights. The man watched my every move, his eyes burning into me. The air felt heavy, thick, like I was breathing through mud. You best eat, he croaked, his voice barely a whisper. Long road ahead. I swallowed hard, the unease turning into full-blown dread. My gut instinct screamed at me to get out, to run, but something kept me rooted to the spot. He tilted his head, revealing a flash of metal, a chipped, crooked tooth. Ever been on the Devil's Highway? His words slithered across the table, cold and insidious. The waitress passed by, giving me a concerned look. I tried to form words to beg her for help, but all that came out was a strangled squeak. That's what they call it, you know. He leaned forward, the sour smell of his breath washing over me. That stretch of road north of here. Folks go missing on it all the time. Never found, not a trace. The blood drained from my face. I'd heard whispers from other drivers about routes to avoid, back roads where strange things lurked in the shadows. But I dismissed those as just campfire stories, tall tales told to pass the time. As if reading my thoughts, the man let out another dry chuckle. Stories got kernels of truth to am, boy. Sometimes the worst monsters ain't in no book. He slid out of the booth, his movements unsettlingly smooth, and tossed a few crumpled bills on the table. Turning towards the diner's exit, he paused, his hunched form silhouetted against the parking lot lights. They say something hunts those woods. Picks off travelers one by one. Might be wearing a man's skin, but what's underneath, that ain't human. With that parting shot, he stepped into the darkness and disappeared. I stumbled out of the diner a few minutes later, my body trembling, my mind reeling. There was no sign of the man or his vehicle. My half-eaten meal sat forlorn on the table, a testament to the unsettling encounter. In the parking lot, I scanned the tree lean nervously, half expecting to see him again, a watchful specter in the shadows. With shaking hands, I climbed into the cab of my truck, the smell of his stale sweat still clinging to my nostrils. As I pulled back onto the highway, the feeling of being watched intensified. The forest, once familiar and unthreatening, now seemed like a malevolent, living thing. Each rustle of leaves in the wind sent chills down my spine. I pushed the gas pedal a little harder, desperate to put as much distance between me and the Willow Creek Diner as possible. That primal fear never truly left me. Every rustle in the woods, every pair of headlights in my rearview mirror became a potential threat. It ate away at me from the inside, the constant dread making every mile feel heavier than the last. That day on the Devil's Highway, or whatever the hell it really was, marked the end of my trucking career. My name's Luke, and this happened to me back in 2003. I'd always prided myself on being a no-nonsense kind of guy. Truck driving suited me, the open road, long hauls, just me and my rig. It was my daughter's birthday that week, a fact that made the loneliness of my work a bit sharper. Still, pushing through got the job done and put a smile on her face. That's all that mattered. 
This particular trip had me taking a load of textiles from Mississippi down to Texas. I always preferred the long, southern routes, flat, straight, and predictable. The last thing any driver needs is some unexpected switchback on a mountain road, especially at night. The rhythmic rumble of my tires on the interstate had an almost hypnotic effect, but that also meant fighting off bouts of highway sleep. Stopping at a roadside diner was always the best way to break the monotony. Just when I was starting to get twitchy, I spotted a weathered sign up ahead advertising. Ethel's Eats, home cooking and hot coffee. My stomach rumbled in agreement, so I signaled and pulled off the exit into a gravel parking lot next to a low, rambling building. I parked alongside a few other trucks and made my way inside. Ethel's was everything you'd expect from a classic roadside diner, worn vinyl booths, a jukebox in the corner playing old country tunes, a faded calendar of scenic mountains behind the counter. A lone waitress, looking every day of her fifty-plus years, brought me a menu. Before ordering, I excused myself to the restroom. When I came back to my booth, a man was sitting opposite me. The suddenness of his appearance startled me. He was older, probably in his late sixties, with wispy white hair and a deeply wrinkled face weathered like old leather. His faded blue overalls were smeared with oil stains, and he clutched a dirty baseball cap in his gnarled hands. There was a strange intensity in his pale, watery eyes. "'Name's Ezra,' he said." his voice a sandpaper rasp. Long drive, ain't it? Ezra didn't wait for my response. He just stared with an unsettling smile that didn't quite reach his eyes. Been on this road longer than you've been alive, Sonny. He continued, tapping a callous finger on the formica tabletop. Seen some things. A prickle of unease crawled up the back of my neck. I tried to ignore it. Maybe he was just some local eccentric, or a lonely old man eager to spin a yarn. Still, I found myself waving over the waitress, hoping to put space between Ezra and me. The coffee she brought was bitter and scalding, which seemed fitting for the encounter so far. You ever heard tell of the goat man? Ezra asked, taking a loud slurp of coffee. My attempt to dismiss him had clearly failed. The what? I asked, confused. Goat man, he repeated, leaning closer. They say he walks the woods alongside this here highway, hunting lone travelers, snatching him up to his lair. His pale eyes gleamed. A wave of nausea washed over me. Was he playing a prank? Just some bored local. Messing with a passing trucker? His eyes held no trace of humor, just unsettling earnestness. Seen him myself, years back, Ezra mumbled, his focus shifting to a point over my shoulder. Hulking figure in the trees, eyes burning like red coals. His words sent a chill through me, a sense of unseen eyes staring from the shadows. My logical mind fought to reject the absurdity of the situation. It was just a tall tale, a bit of local folklore. I forced a laugh, trying to break the tension. Sounds like something you'd see on one of those late-night monster shows, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. But Ezra fixed me with another one of his intense stares. Folks go missing out there, son. Good folks. Ain't never found a trace of them. A knot of fear twisted in my gut. Missing persons, he'd said. Could there be some truth to his wild story? My usual rationality seemed to be losing its grip. I made a show of checking my watch. Look, appreciate the company, but I gotta get back on the road. Standing abruptly, I threw a crumpled ten-dollar bill on the table and headed to the door. Just as I was about to step out, Ezra's raspy voice cut through the air. Sometimes, Sonny, 
The things you think ain't real are exactly the things you need to worry about. He cackled, a dry, humorless sound. Stumbling outside, I fumbled for my keys, my heart pounding. As I slid behind the wheel of my rig, I saw him standing in the diner's doorway, his pale eyes glinting in the dim light. A figure straight out of a nightmare, and even as I started the engine, I could still feel his gaze follow me down the road. I pushed that encounter with Ezra to the back of my mind, but my knuckles ached from the wide knuckle grip I had on the steering wheel. With every rustle of the wind through the trees lining the highway, every flicker of movement in my headlights, I jumped. The goatman tail, absurd as it was, clung to me, poisoning the solitary miles that lay ahead. When I finally stopped for the night at a rest stop just outside of Houston, I went through the motions of checking my rig and logging my hours, but an unshakable unease kept me on edge. Every shadow seemed longer than it should be. Every crunch of gravel underfoot made me spin around. Sleep, when it finally came, was fitful and riddled with nightmares of clawed hands and burning red eyes. The next morning, I got back on the road, a nagging dread lodged deep in my chest. I had maybe a couple more hours until my scheduled delivery. The highway was desolate, flat, unremarkable. As the hours ticked by, the unease gnawing at me intensified. I started checking my rearview mirror every few minutes, half expecting to see some hulking figure loping after me. It was just past noon when I noticed the car. An old, rusty sedan, it was tailgating me, dangerously close. A surge of adrenaline shot through me. This had to be the goat man. Someone playing sick, twisted games. I slammed my foot on the accelerator, desperate to put distance between us. The sedan swerved erratically, gaining ground. In my panic state, I made a split-second decision, a decision that would change everything. I swerved the truck sharply off the highway, down a dirt road that snaked into a dense patch of pine trees. The sedan screeched past, and for a moment, I thought I had lost them. Breathing heavily, I brought my rig to a halt and jumped out, scrambling through the trees in the opposite direction of the dirt road. Whatever lurked inside those woods had to be better than whoever had been chasing me. I blundered deeper into the undergrowth, the dense foliage obscuring the sunlight. Behind me, I heard the distant crunch of car tires on gravel, followed by the ominous sound of slamming doors. They knew I was in here. And judging by the sound of multiple footsteps, I wasn't facing some lone man-man. There were at least two of them. Maybe more. The forest floor was a maze of tangled roots and fallen branches. Panic propelled me onward, thorns tearing at my clothes, the pounding of my heart the loudest sound in the desolate woods. Just as I thought my lungs would catch fire, I stumbled into a clearing. And there, rising before me, was a dilapidated cabin. Rotting wood and broken windows spoke of years of abandonment, yet a thin tendril of smoke curled from its rusted chimney pipe. Hope flared briefly within me. Help, shelter, a chance. Ignoring the prickle of warning at the back of my neck, the desperate animal instinct for survival pushed me towards the cabin's sagging door. Inside, the air hung heavy with the smell of damp and decay. It wasn't completely abandoned. A threadbare cot, a cracked wood stove, and a few scattered utensils spoke of a crude, desperate kind of occupancy. Before I could process this scene of abject squalor, a figure burst from the doorway behind me. I whirled in self-defense. It was Ezra, his face a mask of wild-eyed fury. Behind him stood two men I didn't recognize, burly, unshaven, with eyes reflecting a mix of violence and cunning. My blood ran cold. I'd escaped the hunters on the highway only to stumble into their lair. Got him, boys!
Ezra cackled, spittle flying from his lips. Caught him trespassing. Fresh meat for the goat man, he thought. The two men advanced, their rough hands gripping lengths of rusty pipe. The absurdity of it all washed over me in a sickening wave. The goat man, it was all a setup. A twisted game to lure unsuspecting drivers into a trap, some sick backwoods entertainment for Ezra and his accomplices. One of the men swung his pipe. I stumbled back, my desperate block doing little to stop the force of the impact. Pain exploded in my arm. They circled me like wolves, pipes raised. My fight-or-flight instincts screamed to run, but there was nowhere left to go. Another vicious blow sent me sprawling. Darkness flickered at the edges of my vision. Through the haze of pain, I heard Ezra's raspy voice cut through the air. He'll pay for not believing. Make a fine sacrifice to the goat man tonight. The woods seemed to tilt and heave, the trees growing taller, casting grotesque shadows that danced like spindly claws. They closed in for the final strike, and the terrifying realization dawned. I might not escape the goat man after all, because the true monsters of the road wore human faces. The news report came weeks later, broadcast on the small TV in a gas station lounge while I gulped down watery coffee. The band of men had been caught attempting to rob a local store. My testimony had been crucial, a small point of justice amidst the horror of the ordeal. They mentioned the abandoned cabin, the makeshift hunting gear found there, and the chilling details of their other potential, sacrifices, who had been lucky enough to get away. The report ended with a stern warning for drivers, a cautionary tale about the dangers lurking beyond the well-lit rest stops and the anonymity of the highways. They didn't mention the goat man, of course, because sometimes the real terror is found in the broken hearts and twisted minds of men. And even now, as I roll on down the endless interstates, a part of me wonders what other hungry eyes might be watching from the shadows, their own monstrous tales disguised as roadside folklore and friendly diner conversation. My name is Dale, and this happened to me in the summer of 2002. I'm a truck driver. It's hard work, but I get to see a lot of the country that way. I've made some good friends, and we have a bit of an unspoken support network rolling. If someone's truck breaks down, or anything else goes wrong, you know you can always count on help. A few months ago, I was down in Louisiana. The humidity was brutal, and I just couldn't wait to get north again, maybe make it to the Rockies before it got too hot. I was on the I-10, making good enough time, when I got a call, Byron needed a hand about a hundred miles away. One of his tires shredded, and he needed me to bring him a spare. Now, Byron's a good guy. Always there when you need him so I swung that big rig around and headed his way without a second thought. Sure, it would delay me a while, but that's how it goes for us truckers. We watch out for each other. I pulled off the highway and onto the shoulder of a feeder road, the kind of deserted stretch that makes the hair on your neck prickle. The place was creepy. Thick trees crowded the road on both sides, and dead scrub lined the asphalt. You could hardly tell there was a road under the branches. Byron's GPS signal was spotty here. I called him again and he said to go deeper in, said I was getting close. I followed the GPS signal deeper into the trees for about a mile. Suddenly it cut off no bars, just static. I slowed to a crawl, squinting into the gloom under the trees. About twenty yards ahead, I saw a figure standing in the middle of the road. It was tall and thin, like it was stretched out. The way it moved was wrong. Twitching, but slow. 
I stopped the truck and lowered the window, calling out. Hey! You need help? The thing tilted its head at me, still slowly twitching. It held a shiny object out towards me. It glinted in the half-light. Byron? I asked, feeling a chill. The figure didn't move or answer. I put the truck back in gear, easing toward the figure. I needed to get this tire to Byron. Get out of this place. As I got closer, something about the thing seemed more and more off. The limbs were too long, the fingers all wrong. My gut clenched, and I slammed the truck to a stop. I put it in reverse and hit the gas, the big rig lurching back the way I came. I glanced back at the rearview mirror. The figure was running after me, all wrong, like a spider, limbs bent at impossible angles. Faster than it should be able to go. I floored it, panic rising in my throat. The truck bounced and lurched on the old road. I was probably doing fifty, but in the mirror, the thing was gaining on me. My head pounded, my fingers cramped white on the wheel. Ahead, there was a curve I didn't remember seeing when I came along. I took it too fast, the heavy weight of the trailer swaying wildly. The thing was closer, a blur of jerky motion in the mirror. I thought of Byron, back on the interstate with a blown tire. If I could just make it. Suddenly, the figure leapt. It landed with a heavy thump on the hood of my truck scrabbling and clawing at the windshield. Glass shattered, raining down on me. I yelled, twisting the wheel hard. The truck slammed into a tree and everything went dark. I woke up in a hospital bed. My head was throbbing, and my arm was in a sling. It took a few moments for memories of that place, and the thing on the road to slam back in. The cops told me a trucker found me passed out a few miles up the road from my wreck. There was no sign of the thing. Byron was fine, too. Someone stopped for him on the interstate, and he'd already gotten back on his route. I told the cops everything, well, the parts they'd believe. They gave each other that look, the one that says they think I'm crazy. I haven't taken a run down to Louisiana since. I stick to major highways when I can. Every now and again, I catch a glimpse of something moving wrong in the trees, something too long or too fast. I don't wait around to see what it is. I just hit the gas and hope the truck doesn't give out before I cross another state line. My name's Ray. And this happened to me back in 1998. I'm a long-haul trucker, always have been. My wife hates me being gone so much, but the bills gotta get paid, right? Mostly I keep to myself. On the road that long, you see a lot of the country, and a fair bit you'd rather not. That spring, I was hauling a load down to Texas— the kind of run that puts your backside to sleep and makes your eyeballs feel like they're covered in sand. I figured I'd push through the night, grab some sleep near Austin in the morning. Somewhere in northwest Louisiana, about two in the morning, I came up on a stretch of empty two-lane highway. Not much out there but swampland and pine trees. That's when I saw the headlights behind me. It was a big truck, the kind they use in the oil fields, with enough off-road lighting to make the sun jealous. I'm not a competitive sort, but whoever was driving the thing was riding my bumper, high beams glaring in my mirrors. I sped up a little to make room. The headlights dropped back, like the truck had passed. A few minutes later, they reappeared right behind me. I couldn't see a cab, or even a trailer behind those blinding high beams. What kind of idiot rides with? Something slammed into the back of my rig. I swerved, barely keeping the truck on the road. 
red and blue lights suddenly flashed in my rear view and a siren blared, the kind the cops use. I eased the truck onto the shoulder and pulled the brake. Whoever was behind me passed on the left, those huge off-road lights swamping me in white. My heart pounded in my chest like a trapped bird. Just some yahoo messing around, I told myself. Probably drunk. But as the truck thundered away, I didn't see any taillights fading down the road. Just darkness. That's when the radio crackled. A low, raspy voice, not even coming from the CB, like it was right in my ear. Bad boy, speeding in my forest. My blood ran cold. I spun around, staring out into the black trees. No one there. I snatched up my mic. Who the hell? The voice rasped again on the radio. You owe me, bad boy. Get lost, free show. I said, forcing my voice to stay even. I threw the truck in gear and rolled out. A mile down the road, I looked in the mirror. No one behind me. Relieved, I let out a shaky breath. Then I saw them. Two pairs of headlights burning in the trees at the edge of the road, following me. I pushed the truck faster, the pines whipping by. But the lights in the trees kept pace. I snatched the CB again, shouting for help, anyone. But there was just static. Like I was the only one on the whole damn highway. I glanced back, more lights in the trees now. A dozen, maybe. Some of them weren't headlights. Greenish pinpricks of light, blinking in and out of the shadows, way too high off the ground for any vehicle. I fumbled for my phone. But it buzzed in my hand, the screen gone dark. Dead. Up ahead, I saw a break in the trees. An exit. Civilization. I jammed on the brakes, swerving onto the off-ramp, the truck leaning dangerously. It was gravel, barely more than a track, twisting off through the trees. Headlights flared behind me. The voice blared in my ear. You can't run, bad boy. Nowhere to hide. The off-ramp was narrow, my big rig bucking and struggling. But I had to try. I was going too fast, bouncing across ruts and potholes. I spotted a clearing ahead, a faint glow of light. Hope flared in my chest. Somebody's house. Maybe I can get help. I hit the clearing at top speed the trailer swaying violently, and the world seemed to tilt. It wasn't a house out there. It was a drilling rig. Floodlights painted it white, stark against the night sky. There was no one around, just the rig towering over some kind of open pit in the ground. I slammed the brakes, but the truck skidded on the loose gravel. It plowed right toward the edge of that pit. It was huge, the bottom lost in the dark. The reek of sulfur and something else foul drifted up. With a lurch and a screech, the trailer toppled over the edge. The tractor cab tipped after, headlights pointing straight down into the pit. I fell hard against the seatbelt. Time slowed. I thought about my wife, thought about my girl. Then I was falling. Down, down, down. The cab jerked and swayed, and I braced myself for the final impact. I hit hard, glass and metal exploding around me. The world spun into blackness. I came to choking on dust. I was still alive, but pinned under the crumpled remains of the cab. Pain flared in my leg, sharp and sickening. I thrashed uselessly, trying to free myself. The rig groaned above me, metal shifting, threatening to give way entirely and crush me. I blinked back tears. Think, damn it, think. I strained my ears for any sound of help, but there was only the drip of fuel from the ruptured tank and the distant howl of what might have been a coyote. Out the broken windshield, the bottom of the pit was still shrouded in darkness. 
I saw no way to crawl out in this direction. I could only hope someone would find me before the leaking gas ignited. My eyes fell on a metal case under the passenger's seat. Emergency flares. Grunting with the effort, I twisted and wriggled, my pinned legs screaming in protest. Reaching under the seat, my fingers scraped across the rough metal. I fumbled the case free and struggled to open it, one hand useless. Finally, the lid popped open. I grabbed a flare, the rough texture of the fuse tape sharp against my skin. Twisting it, the flare sputtered to life, casting a harsh red glow on the mangled cab. My heart sank. I was too low to be seen from the road. But even if I wasn't, who would stop for a wrecked truck? Not anyone who'd heard that voice on the radio. Not anyone who had seen those lights in the trees. I had to climb out. With a desperate surge of adrenaline, I shoved against the wreckage overhead. The cab creaked, and hot metal dug into my shoulder. Gritting my teeth, I pushed again, harder. Nothing. The flare hissed, and I scrambled frantically. Grabbing the second flare, I twisted it, the red glow brighter this time, throwing my frantic silhouette into stark relief. I waved the flares over my head, shouting myself hoarse, the words echoing uselessly into the pit. A new sound cut through my screaming, a rhythmic thumping, low and resonant. It was coming from below, from the pit itself. I froze, the flares still burning in my hands. The thumping grew louder. Suddenly, the earth under me gave way. Gravel and chunks of torn road tumbled past, swallowed by the darkness below. I clung to the steering wheel, panic rising like bile in my throat. Then I was sliding, half-falling, landing hard on a slope of loose dirt. I scrambled back, away from the edge, the flares rolling from my grasp. Darkness closed in, except for one pale green light. I spun around, and my breath caught. It was an eye. Larger than a dinner plate, glowing in the dark like a radioactive cat's eye. Below it, something vast and slick moved, a flash of scales in the dimness. The stink that rose from the pit was overwhelming now. Rotted eggs and something sweetly, sickeningly wrong. Another glowing eye opened below the first. Then the entire pit seemed to light up with dozens of smaller eyes. The creature, whatever it was, was rising. I fumbled backward, my hands scrabbling in the dirt. The ground vibrated under me, and the first of the glowing eyes rose above the rim of the pit, followed by a massive, mottled head. The creature didn't roar. Its gaping moss seemed too wide to make a sound. Instead, it released a piercing hiss that shook me to my bones. My ears rang, and my nose burned with the sulfurous stench of its breath. Terror turned to a numb, mindless determination. I scrambled to my feet and ran. Blindly, stumbling over the jagged terrain, I heard the thump and hiss of its pursuit, gaining on me. Ahead, the pit wall loomed, impossibly high. Branches scraped at my face, tearing into my skin, but I hardly felt the pain. I leapt at the wall, clawing desperately for purchase, and found a rough root. Hauling myself upward, I heard the creature bellow in frustration below. I climbed, sobbing and gasping, until I reached the rim. Without a glance back, I launched myself into the trees and ran. I don't know how long I ran. I fell, got up, stumbled onwards, thorns tearing at my clothes, my lungs burning. It seemed an eternity before I collapsed in a tangle of ferns, unable to go further. Hours later, the sun filtered through the trees, dappling the ground with weak light. I heard the distant rumbling of trucks on the highway. Relief washed over me, then something else, shame. I couldn't tell that story. No one would believe me. 
I stayed hidden until dark, then stumbled back to the road. By sheer luck, a trucker stopped for me. When he asked about the wreck, I told him I'd swerved to avoid an animal and gone over a bank. The story made the local papers. Trucker survives highway accident. There was no mention of oil rigs, or pits, or glowing eyes. Sometimes, when I think no one is listening, I whisper the truth out loud, over and over, until the words lose all meaning. I've seen things no one is meant to see. Sometimes I wonder if I really got away, or if whatever was down there in that pit is simply waiting. I try to push the thought down. After that, I quit long-haul trucking. My wife is happy, but still gives me that look sometimes. She knows something changed in me out there in those Louisiana swamps. It's in my eyes when I see too much darkness, in the way I jump at shadows that move just a bit too fast. Because something followed me back that night. Something I'll never be entirely free of, no matter how far I run. My name's Marcus, and this happened to me back in 2010. I'm a trucker. Been hauling cargo up and down the East Coast longer than I'd like to admit. Seen a lot, mostly the endless highway and the inside of truck stops. My wife says she misses me, but I think she's gotten used to having the bed to herself. That summer, I had a run taking me down to rural Georgia. Cotton fields and humidity so thick you can practically chew it. I was about an hour from my destination when the rain hit. One of those sudden summer storms that turns the sky black as pitch. The radio crackled with warnings about flash floods and I knew I needed to find somewhere to wait it out. Just then, I saw a sign peeking through the trees up ahead. Salvation rest stop, gas, food, shelter. Perfect timing, I thought, and gunned the truck towards it. The place was a relic, the kind you hardly see anymore, built way back before the interstate. Low, sprawling buildings with peeling paint and a flickering neon sign. Something about it made my skin crawl as I pulled the truck into the cracked asphalt lot. The place was deserted. No cars, no other rigs, just the rain hammering down. I hopped out of the cab and sprinted for the main building, already soaked through. Inside was dim. A few dusty plastic tables, a counter with a dented, ancient cash register, and rows of empty shelves. Not a soul in sight. I was getting ready to head back to the truck when I heard a cough from behind the counter. An old man shuffled out, stooped and wheezing. His hair was white and long hanging down over a heavily lined face. He wore a stained white shirt stretched over a bony frame. Can I help you, son? He rasped. His eyes were an unsettling pale blue. Storm's bad, I said. Thought I'd wait it out. Get some gas, too, if your pumps are working. They do, he replied. The old man's voice was so low. I could barely hear him above the rain. Coffee's fresh, he rasped, gesturing to a tarnished pot on a warped counter. I shrugged. Why not? Sure, I'll take a cup. As he shuffled over to pour it, I took a closer look around. The place was creepy. Faded photos of people I didn't recognize lined the walls, staring down at me like disapproving ghosts. The old man set a chipped mug of steaming coffee in front of me. Name's Ezra, the old man croaked. Marcus, I said, taking a tentative sip. Not bad, actually. Ezra leaned on the counter and stared at me. You a long hauler, Marcus? Yep. Since I was old enough to reach the pedals. He chuckled, the sound like dry leaves rustling. Gets lonely, don't it? 
It did more than I like to admit. That's the thing about the open road. It eats at you. After a while, you start hearing things that aren't there. Maybe even seeing them. The old man's gaze hadn't left me. Suddenly, he said, They watch, you know. Who? Who watches? I asked, starting to get spooked. Ezra's lips pulled into a thin smile. The ones in the trees. All along the highway. Waiting. My stomach tightened. You talking about animals, Ezra? Deer, or... Not animals, Ezra said, his eyes fixed on some point behind me. They used to be people. People who got too tired, pulled over for a rest, made a wrong turn. The rain hammered against the windows. Sweat beaded on my brow despite the chill in the room. Ezra stared at me, his pale eyes glinting. Tell me, he whispered, you ever look back in the rearview mirror and think, just for a second, that you're not alone? A chill ran down my spine. Sure, sometimes I caught flashes of movement in the trees, shadows too long or too dark. Always wrote it off as exhaustion, the road messing with my head. That's, that's just tricks of the light, I stammered. The old man didn't reply. He just kept staring at me, that unsettling smile playing on his lips. That's when I heard it. A faint scratching sound, like nails on metal, coming from somewhere behind me. I spun around. Nothing. I turned back to Ezra, but he was gone. Vanished into the shadows at the back of the store. Ezra? I called out. No answer. The scratching sound was louder now. It seemed to be coming from outside. I walked toward the back of the store, my heart pounding. At the rear entrance, I froze. There were deep gouges in the wooden door, like something huge and sharp had tried to claw its way inside. The rain had dripped into the marks, the wood already darkening and starting to rot. I backed away slowly, and that's when I saw the handprints. They were smeared across the window in streaks of mud, too high for anyone to reach. And they weren't human. The fingers were too long, too thin, and tipped with ragged claws. My blood ran cold. What the hell was out there? I snatched my phone off the counter. No signal, the screen blared. Of course not. We were miles from anywhere. I heard a thump behind me, something heavy hitting the back door. I spun around. Ezra stood in the shadows, his grin wider now. In his hands was a battered old shotgun. They get hungry out there in the storm. He cackled. Who, what are they? I asked, my voice shaking. Lost souls, he said, and best not to join them. He raised the shotgun, aiming towards the door. There was a splintering crash. Wood tore loose and something slammed into the door, again and again. I cowered behind a table. Help me! I shouted at Ezra. Always two sides to every story, son. He rasped and fired. The sound boomed through the room, followed by a shriek that wasn't quite animal, but not human either. I risked a glance. Moonlight spilled through a fresh, jagged hole in the door. Then it filled with darkness. An eye, just like Ezra's, only larger, glinting pale blue in the dimness. Ezra fired again. The thing shrieked, and the door shuddered violently. Then it was still. I peered over the table cautiously. No eye. No movement. For a long moment, the only sound was the drumming of the rain. Is it gone? I whispered, barely daring to hope. One down, Ezra said. But they ain't ever alone. Frantically, I searched the room. No other way out. If more of those things came. A noise behind me, 
the clatter of the cash register hitting the floor. I spun. Ezra wasn't there. But the back door was open. In the driving rain, a figure stumbled out of the shadows. It was Ezra. He was lurching forward, clutching at his bloody chest, gasping for breath. A long, ragged gash ran across his shirt. Just beneath it, there was a glint of pale blue in the dark. He turned those haunting eyes toward me. They got me. He choked, then pitched forward. He landed face first in the muddy water, unmoving. That's when I saw them. Rising out of the woods, drawn by the gunshots, at least a dozen figures. Tall and impossibly thin, their movements jerky and wrong. In the downpour, their eyes glowed in eerie blue. They stared with hunger. I bolted toward my truck, the keys clutched in my fist. Branches tore at my face, rain blinded me, but I somehow reached the truck, flung myself inside and locked the doors. The figures surrounded the truck. I heard the scraping of claws on the metal roof as they climbed, their eyes burning into the windows. I fumbled for the starter, the engine roaring to life as the figures pounded on the glass. I threw the truck into gear and reversed wildly, knocking several of the gaunt figures down into the mud. They scrambled back up and came for me again, reaching with their two long fingers. I steered with one hand, swiping desperately at the clawing hands with the other. Up ahead, through the blur of rain, I saw the road. Freedom. I slammed on the gas, the figures scattering as the truck lurched forward. I didn't look back until I reached the interstate, dawn beginning to turn the sky a bruised gray. I finally stopped, gasping for breath. My hands trembled on the wheel, and when I looked in the rearview mirror, I half expected to see those glowing eyes following me. But there was nothing, just the endless road disappearing behind me. The cops didn't believe a word I said when I reported Ezra's body. Called it a bear attack, said the old man likely wandered outside and got confused in the storm. But I know what I saw. I don't drive that stretch anymore. I took a route that adds hours to my trips, costs me money, but my wife says it's cheaper than a funeral. Some nights, I still wake up in a cold sweat, hearing the scratching of claws on my bedroom window. It's always followed by a glance in the rearview mirror, that creeping dread that maybe this time, they followed me home. Sometimes I see things in the trees when I'm driving. Long, thin shadows lurking just at the edge of my vision. I push down the fear and tell myself the road can make you crazy. It was just Ezra, off his rocker, trying to scare me. But deep down, I know that's a lie. I know there are things out there in the shadows, lurking between those endless pines. Things that wait for the unwary, the ones who fall asleep at the wheel, or just get too tired to keep going. I also know this, I got lucky. Some people who pull off to the side of the road aren't seen again. The trees swallow them whole, leaving their rigs abandoned, their stories untold. My name is Ben, and this happened to me back in 2006. I've been driving cross-country since I was 18, right out of high school. The freedom, the miles flying by, it beats flipping burgers any damn day. My wife doesn't like it much, but she knows that's what I am. A born rambler. That fall, I was hauling produce from California up to Washington State. It's a long run, and by the time I hit the Oregon border, I was ready to just crash for the night. It was getting dark, and the rain had started. That blinding, sideways rain the Pacific Northwest is famous for. I pulled off at the next exit, figuring I'd find a motel. 
Instead, I found one of those old-school roadside diners with a gravel lot and flickering neon out front. Mabel's Place, open 24-7, the sign promised. I figured they must have rooms out back or something. My stomach was rumbling, anyway. Might as well grab a bite, kill two birds. Inside was like stepping back in time. Red vinyl booths, a countertop with round stools, and yellowed photos of classic cars on the walls. The smell of grease and coffee hung thick in the air. The only other patrons were a grizzled biker dude in the corner, and a tired-looking waitress with the name, Flo, stitched on her uniform. Coffee, huh? Flo said, pouring me a cup from a glass pot without waiting for an answer. Thanks, I grunted. I'd been driving hours, and I wasn't in a chatty mood. I scanned the faded plastic menu, ordered a plate of bacon and eggs trucker fuel. Flo headed back behind the counter. Suddenly she froze, her eyes wide with alarm. She turned towards the door with a strangled gasp. What the? I started, then spun around to see what had her so terrified. A man stood framed in the doorway, rain dripping from his soaked clothes. He was tall, but stooped over like his back hurt. A shock of gray hair poked out from beneath a battered baseball cap. When he looked up, his bloodshot eyes locked on me, and a chill ran through me. There was something off about him. His skin looked too pale, stretched tight across his skull. His eyes were sunken like he hadn't slept in weeks. And the smell, sweet sour, like rotting meat. Close the damn door, the biker dude growled. You're letting the cold in. The man in the doorway took a shambling step inside, eyes still fixed on me. Flo let out a whimper and backed away. I reached under my jacket to the pocket where I kept my pistol. I always carried, but out here on these empty stretches of road, you never knew. Don't look at him, the biker muttered, sliding out of his booth. Just ignore him. But I couldn't. The figure inched closer, its gaze never leaving mine. And now that it was closer, other things seemed wrong. Its fingers were too long, ending in dirty nails that looked more like claws. There was something jerky, unnatural about its movements. Then it smiled. A smile splitting its face too wide, showing too many teeth. Filthy, pointed teeth. A low growl rumbled from its throat. Help, Flo whispered, her voice choked. My gun was in my hand now. Stay back! I shouted at the thing. Don't make me use this. It cocked its head at me, a questioning glint in its bloodshot eyes. Then it lunged. The biker was there, somehow surprisingly quick for someone his size. He moved between me and the thing, throwing a punch that sent it sprawling back. He grabbed my arm. Come on, kid, let's go! I didn't resist. We bolted out the diner door, the things in human shriek echoing behind us. I stumbled behind the biker, fumbling for the keys to my rig. He was yelling, but all I could hear was the pounding of my own heart. Those woods ain't safe, he shouted, gesturing toward the black trees crowding the highway. Hill, the biker never finished his sentence. In a blur of motion, the thing erupted from the shadows and latched onto him. Its two long fingers sunk into his back as it tore open his leather vest. He screamed, the sound cutting off abruptly as the thing threw him to the ground. I stumbled back, gun raised and shaking. It turned toward me, bits of bloody leather still clinging to its teeth. I fired. Once, twice, three times. The thing jerked with each impact, but it didn't go down. It wasn't even bleeding. I fired again. Then there was nothing but the click of an empty chamber. The thing stalked towards me, swaying slightly with each step, but undeterred. 
I spun around and fled towards my truck. I could hear it behind me, snarling, its heavy footsteps splashing through the puddles in the lot. I fumbled the key into the lock and flung open the door. I hadn't even managed to climb inside when it was there. Its ragged claws scraped the side of the truck, the sound setting my teeth on edge. One of those filthy hands clamped onto the door handle. The handle jerked in its grasp, and for a heart-stopping moment, I thought the flimsy door would give way. Then, with a lunge, I was inside the cab, scrambling to slam the door shut. The thing pounded at the window, its eyes blazing with fury. I fumbled for the starter, hands shaking. The engine sputtered, then roared to life. I threw the truck in gear and hit the gas, tires spraying gravel. The thing chased for a few yards, then fell back into the shadows, its enraged snarls fading behind me. I drove all night, barely stopping for gas or food. My fingers were locked around the steering wheel, knuckles white. Every shadow in the trees looked like the thing. Every rustling in the bushes felt like its approach. Dawn found me in a truck stop parking lot, too exhausted to keep going. I climbed out, legs wobbly. People were starting to move around, getting their days started. They looked at my wild eyes and bloody t-shirt with a mixture of pity and caution. I knew they thought I was just another trucker strung out on meth. Someone had called the cops on the biker, most likely Flo. The diner would be swarming with yellow tape and officers asking questions she couldn't answer. There was no way I could go back there, no way I could tell them what I saw. They'd lock me up, take my license. It would be the end of my life as I knew it. I drifted to a far corner of the lot and collapsed on a bench, exhaustion pulling me under like a dark tide. When I woke, hours had passed. It was mid-afternoon. I stared at my hands, still caked in dirt and spattered with the biker's blood. His sacrifice had bought me time, but for what? What was I supposed to do now? Then I saw the newsstand. A tabloid front page screamed a headline that made my blood run cold. Missing trucker's rig found abandoned. Beside the headline was a blurry image of my truck, cordoned off with tape on some lonely stretch of highway. The story said I'd vanished. There were hints of foul play, dark possibilities whispered between the lines. I bought the paper. It would tell me where they found my truck. That was where I had to go next, before the cops swarmed. The thing might still be there, lurking. But I had to try. Maybe there was something there, some clue to what it was, some way to stop it. I also bought a cheap duffel bag and stuffed it with supplies, water, canned food, rope, a tarp, my toolbox. I felt a grim certainty settling in. I wasn't just running and hiding anymore. I was going hunting. Back on the highway, I pushed my rig to the limit, eyes fixed on the GPS coordinates in the newspaper article. Every mile closer, the knot in my gut tightened. Finally, I saw it up ahead, the flashing lights, the huddle of cop cars, the yellow tape cordoning off a desolate stretch of road. My truck was half hidden in the trees, I must have swerved when the thing attacked. I pulled over well before the roadblock and set off on foot into the woods, the duffel bag slung over my shoulder. The trees grew thick here, sunlight barely filtering through. Late afternoon, shadows stretched long, and I felt the first prickle of fear. The place felt wrong. The usual sounds of the forest were absent. No birdsong. No squirrels rustling in the undergrowth. Just an oppressive silence. I thought I smelled that rotting sweetness again, faint but unmistakable. At last I found my truck. What was left of it, anyway? The cab was crumpled, streaked with rust-colored stains. The passenger seat was torn to shreds, stuffing spilled everywhere. 
It was where the thing had gotten the biker. I crept closer, looking for any sign, anything to make sense of the monstrous creature. Then I saw it, a tuft of dirty gray hair caught in the jagged metal edge of the roof. I dug into the duffel bag and pulled out a pair of heavy work gloves. Gingerly, I grabbed the hair. It was coarse, wiry, nothing like any animal I'd ever seen. I slipped it into a plastic baggie, evidence, or at least something to prove I wasn't completely crazy. The sun was beginning its descent now. I had to find somewhere to camp for the night. I spotted a clearing ahead, where the ground rose slightly into a hill. High ground, that was safer. As I approached, I saw the flicker of flames. And then I heard voices. I froze, heart pounding. Had the cops gotten here faster than I thought? Was the thing still around, drawn by the fire? Slowly, I eased my way closer, crouching low behind a thick bush. Peering through the branches, I could just make out their faces. They weren't cops. They were a group of men, five of them, dirty and unshaven, wearing camo gear. And they were armed. Shotguns, rifles, even what looked like a crossbow. I'd heard stories about folks like these. Off-the-grid types, living out in the wilds. Most folks called them crazy, but maybe they weren't so crazy after all. Maybe they knew things most people didn't. The sort of things a trucker hauling produce up the Pacific coast never needed to know about, until now. The sun dipped below the horizon. The men's fire cast long, dancing shadows on the trees. One of them rose, stretching, and I finally got a good look at him. It was the old man from the gas station. The one who had been in the woods, watching from the trees. The one who'd helped Ezra feed folks to those, those things. A wave of bitter disgust washed over me. I turned and crept back into the deepening shadows. I needed a new plan. I was a damn good driver, a better mechanic. But Hunter? That was a whole different game. Maybe, just maybe, these backwoods survivalists were my best hope now to hunt the things that hunted us, and to keep the rest of the world safe on those endless, unsuspecting miles of highway. My name's Ray, and this happened to me back in 1992. I was hauling a load of lumber up to Montana the kind of run that puts your back molars on edge. It was late summer, but the mountain air already had that sharp bite that means winter's coming. My wife hated me being gone so long, but like I said, bills don't pay themselves. I made it to a little town called Red Creek, nestled in a valley with snow-capped peaks looming in the distance. It was the last stop for gas before a 200-mile stretch of empty two-lane highway. I pulled off at one of those combo roadside diners and truck stops, the kind that always smell faintly of diesel and stale coffee. Inside, the place was dead. A few locals hunched over their plates of eggs and bacon, and a waitress with tired eyes poured me a cup of coffee without having to ask. I should have just eaten there gotten back on the road. But something about the worn-out booths, the flickering fluorescent lights, made me want to linger. Bad move on my part. The bell over the door jangled, and a man walked in. He was tall, with a kind of rangy build you see in ranch hands. One leg of his faded jeans dragged on the floor like he'd been injured at some point. He slid into a booth across from me and nodded in my direction. I nodded back. It's an unspoken rule out here, you greet other road folks. We all know the loneliness that stretches out with those endless miles. Place is dead, the man said. His voice was a rough rasp. Slow night, I agreed. 
beats being stuck in traffic, though. The waitress came over to take his order, and that's when I got a good look at his face. His skin was sallow, like he hadn't seen the sun in years. But his eyes, those eyes settled on me, and a shiver ran down my spine. They were the color of a faded bruise, and just as cold. I'd seen that look before, in predators out in the wild. This man was a hunter, and something told me I was the prey. He ordered coffee, no food. The waitress left the pot on his table then scurried back behind the counter. He poured himself a cup and didn't touch it. Just watched me over the rim. I shifted in my seat, pretending to check my phone for messages. My wife hadn't texted, just the usual silence on those long halls. But I didn't want to look up to meet his gaze again. New rig you got there? The man asked. I tensed, but forced myself to look him in the eye. Fairly new, I replied. My voice came out more steady than I felt. The silence stretched out as he sipped his coffee, his eyes never leaving mine. I could hear the ticking of the clock above the register, each second crawling by. Nice to have something reliable out on those roads, he finally said. Something about the way he said roads made my skin prickle, like he wasn't talking about the highway. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore. I dropped a few bills on the table and stood up. Well, I gotta get going. Long stretch ahead of me. The man's eyes flickered down to my pistol, holstered on my hip. You never know what you might run into out there in the middle of nowhere. He grinned, and I saw his teeth were yellowed, with gaps in between. I headed out the door, acutely aware of his eyes on my back. He didn't follow, but I could still feel his gaze as I walked out to my truck and climbed inside. I fired up the engine and got the hell out of there. I didn't stop for another hundred miles until my eyes were blurring and my heart was pounding like a jackhammer in my chest. When I finally pulled over, it was full dark. I crawled into my cramped sleeper cab, trying to convince myself I was overreacting. But I couldn't shake the image of that man with his bruise-colored eyes and the predatory gleam in them. I didn't get much sleep that night, just fitful dozing punctuated by nightmares of being hunted. The next day, I drove harder than I should have, pushing myself to get home sooner. I told myself it was because I missed my wife, missed my own bed. But I think deep down, I was running from something else. A few days later, back home and trying to settle back into my routine, I pulled up the local news on my phone. It was the kind of small-town website full of reports on lost cats— and upcoming bake sales. But one headline made my blood run cold. Red Creek Diner Owner Found Dead, the story said the waitress, probably the one with the tired eyes, had found the owner slumped over the counter, surrounded by shattered coffee cups and spilled sugar. Cause of death, massive heart attack. But I couldn't shake the feeling that I had something to do with it. That somehow... That man in the diner had willed the old man dead. Like some kind of curse he carried. I try not to think about it most days. But nights when the wind howls outside my window, or I see the glint of distant headlights on the highway, I think of the man with the bruise-colored eyes still out there, maybe. Still watching, with that hungry look in his eyes. I keep my gun close, and if I'm on a long haul and see a lone figure eyeing me from a dusty roadside diner, I keep on driving. Sometimes I wonder if the dead are the lucky ones. Maybe whatever's out there, waiting in the shadows, is worse than anything we know. My name's Marcus and this happened to me back in 2006. I'm a long-haul trucker, always have been. 
My wife, bless her heart, tolerates it, but I know she wishes I'd find a job with more normal hours. The money's good, though, and I get to see a lot of this country. That winter, I was running late on a shipment headed down to South Texas. Snowstorm had shut down the interstate, cost me hours. I called my dispatcher and told them I'd be pushing late into the night to try and make up the time. By the time I hit the Oklahoma border, I was so tired I could barely see straight. I knew I needed to pull over and sleep, but the delivery was time-sensitive, and every hour counted. I figured I'd just stop at the next rest area I came across. Problem was, the next one didn't show up, and the next one after that was closed for construction. I was starting to get desperate when I saw a sign looming out of the darkness. Longhorn rest stop gas, food, lodging next right. It wasn't one of the state-run stops, but I was beyond caring. I turned off the highway and onto a gravel road that wound between fields. The snow was coming down thick now, swirling in the headlights. Finally, the rest stop came into view, a low, rambling building with dim lights and a half-empty parking lot. Inside, it was like stepping back in time. Everything seemed tinged with yellow, the cracked linoleum floor, the wood-paneled walls, the ancient buzzing fluorescent lights. A few other truckers were slumped over bowls of chili at the counter. Behind it, a middle-aged woman with a faded cowboy hat and weary eyes was pouring coffee. The whole place smelled of stale grease and diesel fumes. I walked up to the counter and ordered a burger, fries, and the strongest coffee they had. The woman set the food down without a word. I started to eat, but man, it was bad. Like the worst kind of truck stop food imaginable. The meat tasted weird, the fries were soggy, even the coffee had a burnt flavor. But I was starving, so I forced myself to swallow a few bites. Then I noticed a couple of the other truckers whispering and looking at me. I figured they must be laughing at the face I was making as I tried to choke down the burger. Suddenly, the front door swung open and a man stepped inside, shaking the snow off a wide-brimmed hat. He was dressed in black from head to toe, and even with the hat on, I could tell he was tall. Way too tall. And he moved with jerky, inhuman strides like his limbs were too long for his body. He didn't look at anyone. He just walked straight up to the counter, right past me. I tried to shrink down in my seat, tried to become invisible. But it was no use. The woman behind the counter saw him and gasped, knocking over a coffee pot. No, not again. She whispered. The tall man didn't speak. He simply reached out, his fingers impossibly long, impossibly white. They settled on the woman's arm. I'll never forget the sound of her scream, high and unnatural, like a rabbit caught by a hawk. She tried to pull away, but he held her tight. I watched in horror as the woman's skin started to turn gray, shriveled, as if every ounce of life was being drained from her body. The other truckers were on their feet now, shouting. One grabbed a tire iron from his rig and swung it at the tall figure. It passed right through him, like he was made of smoke. The woman slumped to the ground, a husk, nothing left inside. The tall man turned and looked at me. In the harsh fluorescent lighting, his eyes gleamed black, like oil slicks. You should have finished your food, he said. His voice was a rasp, barely audible over the panic yelling in the room. Then he was walking towards me. My body froze, terror seizing my muscles. The other truckers backed away, eyes wide. I knew nobody was going to help me. He reached out. His icy fingers brushed my skin. I thought it was the end, felt my life draining away. But then there was a loud bang. 
The smell of gunpowder filled the air. The tall man staggered back, a look of surprise on his gaunt face. One of the other truckers was standing there, revolver in hand, the barrel still smoking. The tall man looked down at his chest. There was a hole where the bullet hit, clean through, but no blood. Just a wisp of darkness curling up from the wound. Shouldn't have done that, friend, he rasped. His inky eyes flicked to the trucker who had fired. The man swallowed hard, his hand shaking on the gun. The tall man turned and walked back towards the door. We all watched, too terrified to move. He stepped out into the storm and then vanished, swallowed by the swirling snow. His footsteps faded, then there was nothing but the pounding of my heart and the whimpering of the other truckers in the dead silence that followed. Someone called the cops I don't even remember who. When they arrived, the place was a madhouse. Yellow tape, flashing lights, the shell-shocked truckers giving statements. They found the woman's body, of course, but no sign of the tall man. The cops didn't believe a damn word we said, treated us like we were all crazy or on drugs. They found the bullet, though, lodged in the wall behind the counter. Figured it had been a ricochet, one of the truckers had probably panicked and fired wildly. Case closed for them. Probably the woman had some kind of medical emergency, and we all hallucinated the rest. None of us slept that night. We huddled together in our rigs, parked in a circle facing outwards, like some wild west wagon train against an unseen enemy. Morning came, but none of us wanted to leave, to hit that open road alone again. Finally, one of the guys, a grizzled old driver named Hank, got on his CB. Look, he said, his voice thick with exhaustion and something else. This ain't some, some monster thing. It's a man, sick maybe, out of his damn mind, but still a man. If we stick together, keep each other in sight, nobody has to face him alone. So that's what we did. Formed a convoy of me and Hank and two others whose names I forget. We drove non-stop until we crossed the Texas border, trading off at the wheel, always two trucks within sight of each other. Once we hit a major city, we split up, figuring he wouldn't risk it with all the witnesses around. I finished out that delivery, but something had changed in me. Every shadow looked like that tall man, every rustle sounded like his approach. I couldn't get that woman's scream out of my head, or the image of her lifeless body on the grimy floor. When I finally got home, my wife hugged me tight. She's got that faith in me that I don't deserve. She wanted me to quit trucking after that, said it wasn't worth the money, the stress. But there are bills, and the open road, it calls to you, especially when you've spent most of your life on it. Plus, I figured if it was a crazy man out there, someone would stop him. Cops would find him, or he'd move on to some other stretch of lonely highway, preying on whoever got unlucky. I tried to convince myself it was a one-off, a nightmare I just needed to get past. For a while, it seemed to work. I took every precaution, stuck to main routes, slept in well-lit truck stops in view of security cameras. I'd always been cautious, but now it was dialed up to eleven. Then came the news reports. It started with a missing trucker out on the Arizona desert backroads. A day later, they found his body, drained and gray, tucked into a ravine. The papers didn't know what to make of it. Animal attack was the main theory, but there was no blood at the scene, no tracks but the victim's own. A week later, it happened again, this time in Wyoming, then Montana. Same pattern, no clues. Truckers vanished, or were found inexplicably dead in places where nothing dangerous even lived. Panic started to ripple through the trucker community. Dispatches were half empty, loads sat undelivered, 
because nobody wanted to risk it. It couldn't be a coincidence anymore. That tall man was still out there, picking us off like flies. My stomach twisted into knots with every news story. And the guilt, God, the guilt ate me alive. If I'd just finished that damn burger like I was supposed to, would have been me on that slab in the morgue, not those other poor guys. Or if I'd gotten a better shot off, maybe could have ended it that night. But I hadn't. The trucker grapevine lit up. Drivers started carrying guns, even though that's against company policy for most of us. There were whispers of armed convoys, vigilante patrols on the loneliest stretches of highway. But for every guy who was ready to hunt the bastard down, there were two just trying to hide. I was one of the hiders. The road didn't feel like freedom anymore, just a trap. I barely slept, jumping at every sound. My wife finally put her foot down, said I had to quit or she'd leave. I don't blame her. Who wants to live with a hunted man? I found a job driving a local delivery route. Pays crap, and I miss the open highway something fierce. But there's a bed to come home to every night, and the woman I love still in it. Some nights, though, I lie awake, thinking about the tall man out there, somewhere in the dark between the exits. They never nailed the guy, of course. News stories dried up, public moved on. Cops probably wrote it off like a serial killer case gone cold. But we know, us truckers. We still talk about it at the rest stops, lowering our voices like we're sharing ghost stories around a campfire. We skin the parking lots, check the shadows. Because even though the news forgot, he didn't. He's still out there, biding his time blending in at some greasy truck stop diner, waiting. Every now and then you hear a rumor. Truck turns up abandoned, driver vanished. Body found in the desert, skin like old paper. A whisper about a tall figure seen lurking at the edge of the interstate lights. Enough to keep the fear alive, to remind us that nowhere is truly safe, not while that thing walks among us. And some nights... I wonder if he knows where I am. If his black eyes are turned towards my quiet street, my warm house, and if those long fingers are reaching out, just waiting for me to slip up, to get behind the wheel once more. My name's Dave. And this happened to me back in 2019. Trucking's in my blood, my dad drove, his dad before him, and probably a whole line of ancestors going way back. It's hard work, but I get a kick out of the freedom, or I used to, before this whole mess started. That spring, I landed a gig hauling produce up and down the west coast. Should have been a breeze. Decent pay. Beautiful scenery, easy enough routes. It all went smoothly for a few weeks. Then one night, I hit a detour on the I-5, somewhere in the Oregon backwoods. Bad storm had washed out a stretch of highway. The detour took me onto a narrow, winding road cut through thick pine forest. It was full dark, my headlights barely punching through the rain. Suddenly, a rabbit darted in front of the truck. I swerved hard, tires screeching. When I got it under control, I'd veered way over to the shoulder. Heart pounding, I eased the truck back onto the road. That's when I saw it. Standing in the trees at the edge of the pavement, maybe thirty feet away. A tall figure, so tall it couldn't be fully human. The figure had long limbs bent at unnatural angles. I got a flash of pale skin, corpse pale, stretched tight over its bones. It had no clothes, but the rain ran off it in weird, thick rivulets. And the face. The face was just a blur of darkness, but I could see its eyes. 
They shone in the glow of my headlights, like two red embers in the night. I froze. Adrenaline kicked in, but my legs wouldn't obey my brain's scream to hit the gas. The figure didn't move, just watched me with those glowing eyes. Finally, after an eternity, it turned and melted back into the trees as if it had never been there. I snapped out of it, slammed my foot on the accelerator, and didn't stop until I hit a truck stop an hour down the road. I didn't tell anyone what I'd seen. Figured they'd think I was crazy or had been hitting the whiskey too hard. Tried to forget it, convinced myself it was just shadows, some trick of the storm. Didn't work. Next few nights, I started seeing it again. A flicker in the trees, a flash of those eyes at the edge of range of my headlights, a gaunt shape standing motionless in the rearview mirror. Never long enough to get a good look, but long enough to keep me sweating through my shirt. I barely slept. My boss started getting on my case about missing deadlines, making careless mistakes. I wanted to quit, but damn it, I'm not a quitter. Besides, rent was due, and a driver's gotta drive. One night, it all came to a head. I was parked at a rest stop in Nevada. One of those big, brightly lit places that usually feels pretty safe. I was trying to get some shut-eye before an early morning delivery, when I woke up with a jolt. That feeling, like ice water down your spine, that tells you you're not alone. I glanced out the window. I'll never forget what I saw. The tall figure was standing pressed against the passenger side window so close I could see the sickly pallor of its skin in detail. It peered in, those red eyes burning into mine. Then its hand, if you could call that skeletal thing a hand, reached out towards the door handle. I scrambled out of the driver's side, fumbling for my keys, my phone, anything. Heard a muffled thump as it tried to force the passenger door open. The thing was strong. I ran for the rest stop building, shouting for help. Security guards came out, sleep crumpled and confused. We went back to my truck, gun drawn. Nothing. No sign of the creature. The doors were still locked, no scratches, no evidence of anything tampering with it. The guards looked at me like I'd finally cracked under the pressure. That's when the news hit me. That's how it's been all along, isn't it? Nobody else sees the thing. It hides itself from the world, only lets its victims truly glimpse it. Why? Is it playing with me? Testing me? The whispers of missing drivers started creeping into my ears. Found miles from their abandoned rigs, or vanished without a trace. I called the cops a few times, tried to tell them what I saw about the creature. They'd humor me, then pat me on the back and tell me to get some rest. They think I'm nuts. Maybe I am. I still drive. Got a wife and kids who rely on me. But now I stick to well-lit freeways, chain truck stops full of people, anything to decrease the chances of being alone. I keep a loaded shotgun under the seat, but I haven't decided yet if I'd even have the guts to use it if I saw that thing again. The other night, I had the nightmare again. The one where the creature gets into my truck, sits silently beside me, its long fingers tapping on the steering wheel. It never attacks, never hurts me. Just sits there, watching with those glowing red eyes, while I drive down those long, dark highways. Sometimes I wonder if the real horror isn't the creature at all. Maybe it's just a symptom, the physical manifestation of something broken inside my own head. Or maybe it's a warning, a sign of something worse coming on the horizon. Either way, when I'm out there on the road, its shadow stretches out beside mine, long and distorted in the moonlight. And I know, deep down, it's only a matter of time.
My name's Ethan, and this happened to me back in the spring of 2016. I was a long-haul trucker then, hauling freight up and down the East Coast. Married for a few years, had a kid on the way. That kind of responsibility changes the way you think about hitting the open road. I always liked taking the scenic route along the coast through the Carolinas, if my schedule allowed it. This particular run, though, I got a late start and was pushing to make up time. After sunset, I decided to cut inland, take a shortcut through a stretch of backwoods I hadn't been on before. It was a decision I'd regret for the rest of my life. The road was narrow, barely two lanes, winding through thick stands of pine that shut out the fading twilight. My headlights only illuminated a few yards ahead, and I started to get that uneasy feeling you get when you're out in the middle of nowhere and the miles stretch out long and empty. That's when I saw the hitchhiker. He was standing by the side of the road, just a hunched figure with a beat-up old duffel bag slung over his shoulder. I usually don't pick up strangers lots of rules about that for truckers, but it was late, the rain was starting to come down, and something about him tugged at my conscience. Pulled over and he climbed into the cab, the smell of wet denim and something, older, filling the small space. He didn't thank me, just settled into the passenger seat and stared straight ahead, his face barely visible in the dim light. I tried to make conversation, asked where he was headed, got nothing but a grunt in reply. He gave off a bad vibe, put me on edge. A little further down the road, I told him the next town was still a good hour away, asked if he wanted me to pull over, let him try his luck somewhere else. This'll do, he muttered, his voice low and raspy. Pulled to the side of the road, and he got out without a word, disappearing into the darkness and the rain. I watched him go, relieved to be rid of him. Should have followed my gut instinct in the first place. The next morning, I got out to check the tires, prep for the rest of the day's drive. I almost dropped my coffee mug when I saw the blood. Smears and splatters across the wheel well, dark stains streaking the undercarriage. And right there, a couple feet from the rear trailer tires, half hidden by leaves, I saw what was left of a dead buck. But it wasn't roadkill. No way. This thing had been ripped apart. Most of the meat was gone, like something had gnawed at it with powerful jaws. Whatever had done it was strong and vicious, but definitely not human. At least, not any human I wanted to run across again. Shaky hands started the engine, and I got the hell out of there. Didn't stop until I reached a rest area at dawn. Took a closer look at the trailer, but there were no clues about what might have left those bloody streaks. Finally, I had to call dispatch, explain the damage, the delay. They weren't happy about it, but the buck carcass was enough to get them to send another truck to take over the load. When I got back home, my wife was furious I hadn't called sooner, worried sick. I made up some excuse about the truck malfunctioning, couldn't bear to tell her the real story, not with the baby on the way. She didn't buy it, of course. Things were tense for a while after that. But it was the nightmares that were the worst. Images of the torn animal carcass, a flash of yellow eyes from the darkness, and that hitchhiker stooped figure disappearing into the night. I swore off driving at night after that, even when the bills started piling up. My wife, well, we drifted further apart. She wanted me home more, and I kept seeing those shadows on the road whenever I closed my eyes. Then, a few months later, the news came out. A rash of disappearances from a national park not far from where I'd picked up the hitchhiker. Hikers vanishing without a trace, locals whispering about wild animal attacks, Bigfoot sightings, all that crazy stuff. But I knew. Deep down I knew. 
Part of me wanted to go back there, search the woods, maybe find something, even if it meant confronting what I had unleashed on the world. I started going to a local bar, spent too many nights staring at a bottle, telling anyone who'd listen to story they didn't want to believe. Guy loses his mind after a bad stretch on the road. I even convinced myself that's all it was for a while. But then came the night I saw the report on the news. A mangled body found at the edge of the park, the wounds matching that poor buck shredded on the side of the road. My stomach turned, a wave of nausea and something colder, something like bone-deep terror, washed over me. I recognized that handiwork. My wife found me passed out on the bathroom floor. When I came to, she didn't look mad anymore, just scared. I told her everything then. The hitchhiker, the carnage, the feeling that I had carried something terrible into the world with me that night. She held me while I cried. I don't know if she believed me, not entirely, but she believed that it was killing me. And that was enough for her. Next morning, we packed everything we owned and moved across the country to Arizona. Left a note for my old boss, quit the trucking life for good. The desert feels safer somehow. Big, open skies and the shadows out here feel different, older. We got by with odd jobs, got a tiny apartment near the edge of Phoenix. Had our baby girl a few months later. Life's still hard, but it's a different kind of hard. Every now and then, I catch a story out of the corner of my eye on the news. Another missing person, another gruesome discovery in those eastern woods. I don't tell my wife about them. No reason to make her worry more. Besides, it's not like we can do anything about it. That thing, if that's even what it is, is still out there. And sometimes, late at night, I dream of the shadowy pine forests of the Carolinas, hear the steady drumming of rain, and smell the sharp scent of blood hanging thick in the air. My name is Harlan Briggs, and this happened to me back in September of 1994. I've been driving big rigs for close to 20 years by then, seeing most of this country. There's something calming about it when you're alone on the highway, the rumble of the engine, and just miles stretching out ahead. It's my time. That morning, I picked up a load in Reno, Nevada. The destination? A little town in Missouri called Harrisonville. Not a major route, but it paid well enough. I settled in for the long haul, figuring it would probably be a solid three days of driving if I took it steady. Now, this part of Nevada is mostly desert, especially once you get off the interstates. It's empty, flat, and not the sort of place anyone would choose to settle unless they had a reason. Still, there's the occasional outpost, a gas station, a dusty motel, the kind that make you wonder who stays there. Around sundown on the first day, I noticed one of those motels in the distance. It wasn't much to look at, faded paint, a flickering neon sign. I usually push through till nightfall before stopping, but something about this place caught my eye. Maybe it was the isolation, or just the fact that a hot shower sounded like heaven after a day on the road. The parking lot was near empty, save for an old Winnebago and a beat-up pickup truck. I figured whoever owned those vehicles were already settled in for the night, which suited me fine, less chance of getting some drunk stumbling around outside while I was trying to sleep. Inside, the lobby reeked of cheap air freshener and stale cigarettes. An older guy with eyes like faded denim was perched behind the counter flipping through a magazine. I asked for a room, and as he handed me the key, he gave me a long, slow look. Made my skin prickle, as though he was trying to figure out if I was trouble. 
the room matched the lobby's shabby and rundown. The kind of place where you check the bed for bugs before you even put your bag down. But I was bone-tired, and it wasn't like I had a ton of options. I crashed on the bed, figuring I'd leave at first light. Sleep came heavy and slow, filled with strange, restless dreams I couldn't remember upon waking. Around two in the morning, I was pulled out of that thick sleep by a noise a scratching sound, like something being dragged across the floor just above my room. I sat up, every muscle tense. There it was again, a scraping, shuffling noise followed by a muffled thud. Now I'm not prone to spooking, but lying there in the dark with those weird sounds coming from above, I admit to feeling a chill run down my spine. At first, I figured it was just the old motel settling, or maybe someone moving furniture upstairs. But it kept on, rhythmic, methodical, and that's when unease started gnawing at me. I pulled on my boots, figuring I'd check it out. If it was some drunk making a racket, I wasn't above giving the guy a piece of my mind. Creeping out into the deserted hallway, the only light came from a dusty bulb at the far end. Even the flickering motel sign outside had gone dark, casting an eerie quiet over the whole place. The stairs leading up to the second floor looked rickety. With every step, the wood creaked ominously, as if protesting my weight. The noises had gotten louder a persistent dragging punctuated by heavy thumps, like someone was dropping something repeatedly. At the top of the stairs, a long, narrow corridor stretched out before me, lined with closed doors. I moved slowly, straining to hear where the scratching and thumping was coming from. It seemed to be focused around the room directly at the end of the hall. Something clenched inside me. Now that I was up close, there was something else mixed in with the dragging sounds, a low, wet gurgle that made my stomach turn. Standing outside that door, a wave of nausea washed over me. Whatever was happening in there was not right. I wasn't sure if I wanted to know, yet some part of me couldn't turn away. I had to see. Slowly, I reached out and turned the knob. The door creaked open a sliver, and a stench hit me, thick and cloying. It was the smell of copper and old meat. Swallowing hard, I pushed the door wide open. The sight that greeted me froze the blood in my veins. The room was awash in a dim, sickly light. The floor was a canvas of crimson smears, sticky and glistening underfoot. In the middle of the room stood a figure, hunched over a shape on the floor. Its back was to me, but even from a distance, I could make out the unnatural jerkiness of its movements the way it pulled and tore at what lay before it. I gagged, but the sound was lost in a sudden, horrifying realization. The shape on the floor, it wasn't an animal. It was a person. A wave of ice-cold adrenaline jolted through me. My first instinct was to run, but my feet seemed rooted to the spot. The figure in the room shifted slightly, and that's when I saw its hands. They were dark, dripping, and glistening with something far too red to be paint. It turned its head then, just enough for me to catch a glimpse of its face in the dim light. The eyes that stared back at me were empty, black pits, devoid of anything human. Blood smeared its lips, its teeth a stark white against the crimson. Then it smiled, a chilling, inhuman grin that split its face too widely. Snapping out of my trance-like horror, I stumbled backward. My heel caught on something and I fell hard, my head cracking against the wall. The world spun, and for a moment, I knew nothing but a throbbing pain and the sound of approaching footsteps. When I came to, it was daylight. My head pounded, and a wave of nausea nearly sent me retching. I struggled to sit up and that's when I saw the blood. It streaked down the wall beside me, a splatter pattern that told a gruesome story. 
Scrambling to my feet, I stumbled down the stairs and burst out of that godforsaken motel. My hands shook as I fumbled for the truck keys. I had to get out of there, far away from that place and the monster that lurked within its walls. As I pulled out onto the empty highway, I glanced back for just a moment. The motel stood quiet under the harsh desert sun, as if nothing horrific had transpired within its walls the night before. I pushed the accelerator down, desperate to leave it all behind. I never spoke of what I saw that night to anyone. Police? Reporters? They'd lock me up in the loony bin faster than you could say. Delusional truck driver. But it happened, I swear it did. Every so often, I still catch a whiff of that coppery smell, or wake up in a cold sweat, the sound of dragging footsteps echoing in my ears. And sometimes, when I'm driving a lonely stretch of highway, I'll see a rundown motel, just a speck in the distance. A part of me will be tempted to stop, to see if it's him, to try to understand what he is. But the smarter part of me, the part that wants to live, keeps the truck moving forward. I'll never pull over at a place like that again.